right. Good morning and welcome uh, to all. We're going to continue with the uh, papers in this 12th meeting of conservation and restoration. And today they're going to deal with more technical issues. First of all, we've got Marta Lynch Tavares coming from Portugal. And I, I invite you all to take a look at her amazing resume, which you have in the attached documents. She specialized in the conservation of uh, ancient surfaces and its title Redefining Practices, Sustainability in Conservation and Restoration, New Challenges. You have the floor, Marta. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning to you. <laughs> Primeiro, quero agradecer esse honroso convite para estar aqui presente nesse tão importante evento para a conservação e a sustentabilidade. Tá? Cumprimento a organização do evento, cumprimento ao público aqui presente. Então, irei falar sobre redefinidos práticas, a sustentabilidade na conservação e no restauro, novos desafios. Né? A conservação do patrimônio aborda a ideia que, deve, que devemos preservar o passado e o presente sem comprometer as necessidades com... das gerações futuras. A nossa atividade de conservação e restauro é regida pelos princípios e orientadores que estão nas diversas cartas eh, internacionais e surge atualmente um novo conceito, que é o conceito dos princípios da conservação verde, da conservação ecológica, da conservação sustentável. Não é? Embora exista tendência em resumir esse conceito da conservação verde à utilização de produto tóxico, nós devemos fazer uma abordagem holística do problema, certo? Como? Através da implementação de práticas sustentáveis, do tratamento dos resíduos, de reciclagem, utilização de produtos menos tóxicos, da conservação verde, um bom planeamento do trabalho com a implementação de uma conservação preventiva e da manutenção. E sem esquecer também a promoção das atividades tradicionais com a participação da comunidade e da inclusão social. Então, são, é sobre esses pontos que irei falar a seguir na minha apresentação. Né? A conservação e o restauro abrangem diferentes áreas. Né? A pedra, a madeira, o papel. E, e o conservador, restaurador, ele utiliza diversos produtos químicos numa variedade de situações. E a, muitos desses produtos são tóxicos e tem um risco muito grande para a saúde do conservador restaurador. Raise an important uh, relevant risk for the health of restorers and conservators. There's been a generation of profession who have suffered from a number of serious diseases uh, due to the use of toxic products in their profession. So today, young professionals have to pay a lot of attention and be very careful with the use of these products and <coughs> mainly with the use of personal protective equipment. This uh, is a long-standing preoccupation and since 19, the 1970s there's been a number of studies in this field uh, with the aim to regulate the use of harmful solvents uh, who are, which are harmful for human beings and the environment. Even many of these products have been banned in the European Union. Regarding the use of these toxic products in conservation, well, this concern is also a long-standing concern. In 1999, the, the Andalusian Institute for uh, the Historical Heritage, Heritage launched a book on the prevention of uh, working risks in uh, research on historical heritage. Then there was a number of uh, meetings in Portugal on this issue. There is a doctor from the Catholic University of Porto who has uh, done research on that uh, field. She is an expert on health, safety and health, and she's published on the risks for the health of conservators restorers. In practice, nevertheless, many of these toxic products are still used nowadays and 
Unfortunately, this is done without their proper protection. So the interest that might be on a work of art is there, and no, there is no interest on the professional concern for the environment or the practitioner. And this happens a lot when we talk about uh, studios and institutions, and it happens all the time at a private level. So young conservators, uh, uh, restorers, who are going to come into the labor market, have to pay a lot of attention to this, and they need to use personal uh, protective equipment whenever they're going to be using toxic products. So research uh, less toxic products and more sustainable products for conservation and restoration. In 1990, um, the term uh, green chemistry was coined. In 1993, it was uh, approved in the US, its use. Um, so what do we th consider a product that is, can be framed within the framework of green chemistry? Well, it is a product that aims to reduce or eliminate the use of dangerous substances, both during manufacturing and both during the implementation of uh, various processes. So for it to be considered a green product, it needs to be associated with 12 principles, the 12 principles of green chemistry. So summarizing, it is considered a green product when it reduces the consumption of energy, of waste, uh, has a, a smaller toxicity for uh, human beings and the environment. It uses uh, renewable energy sources during its um, manufacturing. In terms of preservation and uh, restoration, this concept, green ecologic, is a new concept and it is not widely used in practice. In 1996, at the New University of Lisbon, the um, Associated Laboratory for Green Chemistry was created and it's been operational in the field of industry, pharmacy, uh, foodstuffs, and mm, recently it has done research in the field of materials and cultural heritage. In 2008, uh, the Youth and Conservation of Cultural Heritage Organization was created in Italy, and it uh, aims to develop innovative solutions and promote more sustainable practices for the conservation of uh, cultural heritage. They also do a lot of research in the field of green chemistry and they promote a number of uh, meetings and uh, congresses. In 2019, their congress was held at the uh, Catholic University of Porto together with a uh, School of Restoration and Conservation. And in 2023, the Congress was held in Romania. They also have a lab, a green lab, that uh, works with uh, solutions of green products for conservation and restoration. We also have uh, key culture, and we talked about this yesterday. We had uh, the presentation, the excellent presentation by Kim yesterday on this. So I'm not going to be delving into this because she already presented to us what are the goals of her organization and her work. Uh, but uh, let me say that this is uh, uh, an association that works for sustainability and to unite culture and sustainability. So they have published a number of books, such as the Waste and Materials Key book, describing uh, pr a proper alternatives to reduce uh, waste in the field of conservation, and also the Energy Key book that provides tools aimed to reducing a carbon footprint. And these and books are available on their website. So within the framework of key culture, there is also a platform that is a, a sustainability and conservation, as I see it, SIC, uh, that incentivizes a sustainable behavior in the field of conservation. And they have also developed a handbook. They've created a handbook on um, green solvents in the field of conservation. This is available online. It can be downloaded from the website of the SIC, the SIC, the sustainability, this uh, platform, sustainability conservation platform. The use of uh, less uh, 
uh, toxic and more sustainable products in conservation and restoration. We need to replace these products with less uh, toxic products that are more environmentally friendly. So, what do we consider green solvents in this field? Well, it is a solvent that protects the artwork with a um, lower likelihood to cause adverse reactions on the surface of the uh, work and it minimizes the chemical degradation of the artwork also it is less toxic toxic for the health of the people using it i mean practitioners and also less toxic for the environment So on our day-to-day -day work, we have to try and not use solvents, but we know that this, more often than not, is impossible. But let's start uh, when we do our uh, trials. Uh, so let's try and start using a dry cleaning and then use aqueous uh, solutions that are less toxic. At the same time, we know that uh, sometimes it is not possible, I mean, uh, to use water. So when we have to use solvents, we need to uh, choose green solvents. And we need to use them together with thickening agents, gelling agents, with a view to reducing the amount of solvents that are going to be used. Regarding gelling agents, there are a number of uh, studies and there is uh, some research since uh, 1980, as you all know. Um, Richard Walbers worked on this a lot, published on this a lot, and he developed a uh, very sizable research on gels that are used for conservation. Also, the uh, Goethe Institute uh, did some research within the framework of a big project whose results are online on the website of the uh, Goethe Institute on the use of gels in conservation. So this week uh, uh, in, at the ICRAM in Rome, there is a congress on the use of uh, green solvents and gels in conservation. Regarding the use of uh, solvents, well, this is unavoidable. So. What do we do then? We need to uh, conduct a, a bibliographical research. Um, there is a uh, guideline for uh, a selection of solvents, which is called Chem 21, describing the factors of exposition and exposure, safety, health, and environment, and it classifies products uh, in recommended, recommended, or problematic, 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 or hazardous, hazardous, highly hazardous. So it's not uh, an easy task to find the <laughs> appropriate solution. So we have uh, gels with solvents, uh, and there is richer research on waste that uh, gels with solvents uh, leave behind. So we have different ways to solve this problem. We have gels in an aqueous system, reducing the level of toxicity. We also have ionic liquid gels that are still being developed, and there is research on its toxicity. There is also research on the products that have been developed based on nanotechnology and some of them are already uh, available in the market. I'm going to talk about them a little bit uh, more later today. So we have a new uh, conservator restorer who is aware of the uh, topic of the toxicity and the risk for the health that need to be reduced and also the environmental impact that needs to be reduced. I mean, uh, the environmental impact of their activities. So, charting the way for sustainability. One of the challenges of the 21st century is climate change. So, yesterday, Mikel, in his presentation, talked a lot about the consequences of climate change. So, this was developed in, in 2021 an online platform was developed called Stish, which is a sustainability tool in cultural heritage preservation. The goal 
for this is to reduce the carbon footprint and the use of green solutions in activities uh, that are developed within the framework of uh, cultural heritage. This platform uh, provides a carbon calculator for the uh, life cycle assessment and it quantifies the environmental products of products and processes. So uh, it is uh, formed by professionals who work in the area in the field of heritage, engineers, restorers, uh, chemical experts. It is available online, it's very easy to use and it provides more than 1,000 uh, uh, materials with a number of categories and subcategories. So we include the, uh, you enter your product and you get the carbon product, you compare products and the platform will tell you which one is going to be more sustainable. So this platform is helpful for heritage practitioners to uh, make a more sustainable choice to reduce the environmental impact of their work. We can also talk about the Belgian Heritage Institute that has recently created a unit of sustainability for conservation. I don't know any other body that has a specific unit for uh, sustainability in conservation. So this uh, body has developed a number of protocols and it has implemented a number of strategies geared to reduce uh, environmental impact with uh, efficient solutions to deal with climate change. And then they have a project that is called Climate Preserve that helps museums to create tools with a view to diminishing the consumption of energy. Also, they deal with how to uh, manage climatization. They offer courses on preemptive conservation and also environmental sustainability. They promote a, a workshop. They organize a workshop. In 2024, they're going to be holding a workshop in the field of uh, sustainability in the field of conservation. And they're going to be organizing this together with ICRA. Uh, if uh, you want more information on this, it is available on their website. In 1992, the NEMO network was created, the Network of European Museum Organizations. It's a network of independent museums. In their last Congress, I think uh, it was uh, held in uh, 2022 in Faro, they created the Working Group for Sustainability. And this working group for sustainability and climate action is led by the uh, IRPA uh, team, that uh, Belgian Institute for Heritage. So how can conservators integrate sustainability and health protection in their daily work? Well, they have to develop or carry out a sustainable professional practice to this end. We need, and it is important, to change our mindset. It is necessary to actually uh, continuously update your uh, knowledge, I mean, to engage in further training. There are many organizations, many, many associations offering courses and training courses, so uh, conservators, restorers need to update their knowledge at all times, and they have to be available to choose new products, new methodologies, new techniques. They have to emit uh, the minimum amount possible of pollutants, environmental pollutants, and avoid accidental disposal. We need to recycle more um, gloves, for example, the gloves that we use. We need to try and reuse them as much as possible. If they're not uh, ripped, we tr need to continue using it more than just once, because vinyl and nitrile uh, protective gloves cannot be recycled uh, generally, because they might get stuck in the recycling uh, machine, and it takes more than a hundred years for them to degrade, actually. However, there are biodegradable gloves in the market already that uh, decompose 20 times faster. So when it comes to buying this type of, uh, well, gloves, 
it would be better for us to buy biodegradable nitrile gloves. Another issue is uh, the fact that aqueous solutions are <coughs> Uh, the least toxic, but they might not be the most ecological because deionized uh, distilled water uh, demands a lot of energy uh, for its manufacturing. So we need to rethink things. When can we use uh, water from the tap? The matter of the quality of tap water is going to depend on the city, the specific case, the uh, company that treats water. So if we ask for the chemical data sheet of that water, then we can look at what kind of uh, application we can uh, give to that uh, water. Filtered water with carbon uh, filters uh, is free of some bacteria and some volatile organic compounds. So we need to rethink this and we need to establish when we can use the type of water and for more for very specific cases we might use distilled water uh, we can pour down the sink or the gutter or the drain uh, toxic solvents because these toxic substances are absorbed by the soil and they reduce soil fertility they increase erosion and they can even uh, pollute food. So in our daily work, we have to carry out a good management of the waste that we produce. Toxic um, waste have to be put in the proper container. They have to be labeled uh, so that we identify the category. There are a number of rules and they need to be met. It is important also that the conservator restorer is trained in the disposal and treatment of waste. And this information needs to be included in the curricula of um, university uh, studies, uh, both graduate and postgraduate. In terms of prevention and protection, let me tell you that the prevention uh, uh, measures go from the correct uh, assembling of the scaffolding, protection measures, individual protection measures, such as the use of personal protective equipment, masks, gloves, etc. It is very important for the practitioner to be aware of the product that they're going to be using so that they know what is the correct equipment, protective equipment that they need to use. because. There are, for example, a number of different filters and masks for uh, different products. So it is important to be aware of that and to have that knowledge. So practitioners have to be able to use PPEs, protective personal equipment, the correct filter. There, are, there are regulations on equipment that need to be uh, met. Products need to be labelled on composition, toxicity. We need to work in ventilated uh, areas. You can't eat in your work and station or the place where you work. This is something that happens very often. And your hands are channels of contamination. If we're working with a toxic solvent and then you eat a, an apple, well, you have to be careful with that because that might be dangerous. So you need to. Uh, be careful and pay attention to that. It's also important to uh, 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 participate in training programs on uh, safety and health at work and waste disposal. Uh, sustainable rehabilitation and buildings. Well, I would like to talk about this, about building rehabilitation. For example, a building in a uh, uh, historical center. This involves a valuable heritage. Mural paintings, tiles, stuccos, and they need to be preserved. So, with the inception of rehabilitation, tourism in great, in big cities, well, I think that this uh, uh, 
does not happen here in Ponte Vedra, but it happens to a great extent in both Porto and Lisbon. Rehabilitation is being carried out through techniques where the facade is preserved and the the rest of the building is actually demolished. So this means that we are sort of missing a whole material technical story and social story. So the ancient traditional techniques are disappearing. Uh, for example, plastering, stucos, uh, and other traditional techniques that are being lost nowadays, unfortunately. Apart from the fact that the building is losing its character. So we don't need to destroy to build again. What we need to do is to preserve and restore. So why do we still have these problems in terms of preservation? Why is there this uh, difficulty for preservation? Well, there is a lack of knowledge and uh, unfortunately, within the framework of that mean that is connected to civil construction, there is a lack of knowledge in terms of the fact that it is possible to actually restore these tucos, these paintings, these uh, ceilings. And there is also an idea behind this that uh, uh, claims that restoring is much more expensive than demolishing. So we still need to um, raise awareness on this. And there is also a lack of knowledge regarding techniques, uh, regarding how to restore, how to uh, carry out these techniques, how to carry out the various techniques. So we practitioners need to know how this is done. In general, these old techniques uh, are techniques that elderly craft people know. So it's important to collect this knowledge on uh, old techniques so that these techniques are actually taught to young practitioners. And this is also contributing to social uh, uh, inclusion, professional integration, and the preservation of the uh, local culture. So we need to take advantage of this knowledge, traditional knowledge, and link them to more than technologies with a view to adapting to climate change. So with the recovery of uh, traditional activities, we're recovering old uh, methodologies of implementation. We contribute to the valorization and reuse of materials. We are collaborating to the development of uh, good practices in terms of the intervention on old buildings and we're contributing to the social and financial development. We need to therefore uh, foster uh, incentives for the recovery of this tradition. Activities are disappearing at an overwhelming rate. Uh, rev sustainable revitalization is a challenge. Uh, this needs to consist in the reuse of existing uh, uh, raw materials through the use of uh, knowledge and techniques that are traditional. The use of uh, traditional techniques and materials and new technologies. Uh, lime, for example, this is a product that has been there for more than 10,000 years. It's a traditional product for us, a sustainable product, which is not toxic and this is something that we use to a great extent in restoration of stone and mural paintings as two coats. We use this for painting buildings, for uh, color reintegration uh, as a consolidating agent for uh, claddings and coatings uh, involving a uh, loss of uh, adherence and cohesion which are two different problems. So for consolidation, we use uh, lime water uh, for the consolidation of claddings that have lost cohesion. So this cohesion loss exists when there is a lack of um, cohesion between different components, that is uh, lime and sand and uh, coating or plastering or mural painting. 
sort of turns into dust. So if you touch there, it sort of turns into touch. So that means that there is a loss of cohesion. So if we want to treat this, we need to uh, consolidate it. There are a number of products, but lime water <laughs> is one of these products, which is sustainable. And I have conducted a number of trials with uh, lime water. And what I recommend is for it to be used. I mean, it has a penetration level of four to six millimeter. It needs to be used when the coating is losing cohesion that is equal or uh, lower than 10 millimeters. So to be able to determine the depth of the cohesion loss, we can conduct a trial with or a test with a gerometer. Um, lime as paint with pigments and uh, lime milk that can be used. As for new technologies, uh, new products, sustainable ecological products that have been developed uh, often through biomineralization and nanotechnologies. So they are less harmful and more sustainable. Some of these products are being commercialized already in terms of biomineralization products. There are a lot of studies that have been conducted on this field. Uh, the University of Granada, the team led by Carlos Navarro, has uh, done a lot of research in this field. So there is a company called Capa Bio, K B Y O, which is a Spanish company that's developed a number of products for consolidation and cleaning. Some of these products <coughs> have been used for the restoration of the uh, Geronimo's uh, monastery in Lisbon. So these products use biomineralization for the manufacturing. Also, we have uh, nano restore products that are based on nano limes and nanotechnology. They've been developed together with the uh, University of Florence in Italy, and many of them are already in the market, available in the market. And also then we have nano lime colosil, nano lime colosil, which is developed based on nanotechnology and with uh, calcium hydroxide and it has been developed in Germany. For the cleaning stage, we have this KYYO Biologica, some cleaning products that are already in the market. We also have these uh, pro cleaning products that are called Nano Restore Cleaning and Nano Restore Gels based on nanotechnology and other sustainable green products such as uh, micro emulsions, micellar solutions, enzymes, uh, uh, aqueous gels with solvents, uh, soap in gel, gel soap. A uh, new research has been conducted on natural biocides through essential oils. This is uh, still recent, but uh, research has been done and has already been done in this field. And there are also the so-called biocides that are developed through nanoparticles, uh, zinc, gold and silver, because silver is antibacterial and disinfecting and also uh, zinc and gold have antibacterial properties. There are further research uh, studies with varnish water-based varnish, some of them are already available on the market. So, conclusions, uh, green sustainable conservation introduces this concept in a number of uh, dimensions, economic, social and cultural dimensions. On the other hand, as I have already said, there is a trend to reduce this 
uh, notion to a chemical approach, but we need to have a holistic approach of the problem. We need to promote the use of traditional materials and techniques. We need to use uh, common sense uh, when making decisions. Uh, when I mean uh, selecting the product is also uh, I mean taking a commitment. We need to improve the conditions of safety and health in the place of work and we need to produce less litre and mainly as far as toxic products are concerned we need to reuse recycle more so we need to have a greater scientific awareness for the practice of conservation and restoration uh, regarding less toxic uh, I mean products that are less uh, regarding the use of uh, products that are less toxic for your health and the environment. We need to eradicate the most dangerous substances, replace them with more ecological alternative solutions. So universities need to include in their curricula for uh, the training courses in this field. Uh, so we need to raise awareness and train people, educate people. So we need to invest in this area and we need to implement research, do research in this field on uh, ecological conservation principles and this will result in a greater transfer of knowledge uh, between uh, the academia and the labor market. This is very important because it can contribute to a more sustainable profession, both for the professional and the environment. It is also necessary to review some principles and methods. I mean, uh, we need to change our mindset. We need to uh, change our mentality, but not only in terms of the mindset of restorers and conservators. We need to also change things in terms of the chemical industry, uh, the academia and companies. So we need to have the goal of uh, promoting research plans via more uh, ecological uh, methodologies and sustainable practices. This is fundamental to exchange experiences and knowledge to help all of us to face this challenge, sustainability in the front of conservation. We need to participate in networks and working groups. I have presented here today a number of organizations and I have encouraged everybody to take part in workshops and this type of events organized by these organizations. And the desire that uh, practitioners have to become more sustainable is emphasizing that duality that's inherent in our profession to preserve our uh, heritage and our planet. The effort around uh, sustainability uh, our commitment and our actions show the possibilities that we have within the framework of the sector of cultural heritage to implement these new practices. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to resume with the next speaker, Mr. Hector Bolivar Sand, who is a researcher in the biodegradation section of the Institute of Cultural Heritage of Spain. He's a biologist specialized in environment, physical anthropology, and education. And he is researching into paleontology and the protection of the cultural heritage. His paper is titled Green Methodologies at the Spanish Institute of Cultural Heritage Experiences for Sustainable Management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, first of all, for having invited me to come to this conference, to this restoration conference. It is um, it's a very hot topic, very interesting topic, and I think that we should tackle it in, in the coming years. From our point of view as uh, workers, of cultural heritage and also from uh, the point of view of citizenship and considering where we are heading as a society. So my paper is titled Green Methodologies at the Spanish Institute of Cultural Heritage. So I'm just going to give you a few examples which can be used as good practices or maybe as ideas or possibilities uh, to carry out a more sustainable type of work based on, just like Marta said, changing the mindset and um, implementing 
methodologies, etc. So the the title of my of the conference is about sustainable museums between question marks. So, uh, what do we consider a sustainable museum? So basically, according to the definition by Brandland uh, that, that was mentioned yesterday, is something that uh, we already know. We have heard it actually in some of the presentations already. And it's a very good starting point. But if we would like to convey that definition to the field of cultural heritage, maybe we don't know how to start. There are other definitions, one of them that I like very much from a recent paper by Navarro, which says sustainability in an intervention on cultural heritage is a result of the interaction and the commitment between the uh, aptitude of the intervention, the, the environmental responsibility, the guaranteeing social cultural benefits, and the economic efficiency of the management. This is a graph which was seen repeatedly yesterday which um, makes us think about those three components of what we consider sustainability. So one of the legs, uh, one of the most obvious uh, components, I would say, is um, the environmental component. So how do we uh, consider something sustainable to be environmental? There is a, a, a regulation in force which is very up to date in Spain, I mean, like the Natura Network 2000, which uh, establishes areas where any activity is banned. So if you are going to take action there, it, this is not allowed. And usually cultural Mm, properties are in rural areas which are protected by the uh, ZEPAs, so we need to abide by the law. Uh, there is uh, something else which is a decree about uh, a catalogue of uh, endangered sh species which tells us to pay special attention to birds and bats. So sometimes when you intervene in particular properties, this may have an impact on birds and bats. And sometimes it's not allowed according to the legislature, legislation. Then there is a law from 2022 which talks about uh, waste and contaminated soils. And it says that uh, um, free requirement uh, contracts require the contractor to follow a system of environmental management, which is called SGA. And well, yesterday we were talking about the need to have ISOs, etc. But in principle, it uh, the purpose is to follow good practices in waste management. We also have the law number seven from 2021, which is about climate change and ener energy transition, which uh, says literally that in every public center, um, um, environmental and, and energetic sustainability criteria should be considered. So uh, it also says that environmental criteria must be considered in every public tender. But as we heard yesterday, if there is not a clear scoring methodology, which explains that maybe um, this is 20 percent of the scoring system, then this is going to be useless because it will just go through the the contract, but it will not be actually um, useful for the contractor. And um, once again, it uh, explains that it's necessary to calculate your carbon footprint. Another important component in sustainability has to do with the social component the conservation of the heritage, it is a means to pass on to future generations the expressions of tangible or intangible cultural heritage. So this is actually the core of uh, heritage conservation, but th there's another social component. In this museum, for instance, as far as I have seen, this is 
very important, which is the social use or the social function of the museum space and its heritage. Like yesterday, I was surprised to see that there were many visits. Uh, I think there was like a concert yesterday. Also, there was an official opening of an exhibition as we were uh, organizing the conference. So that's, that's very nice. It's very lively. And then we have the, the financial component, which actually just makes sense. Uh, we must be cost efficient in our energy expenditure. We have to reuse materials such as uh, boards, showcases, etc. And from the point of view of preventive conservation, we know that we should also um, maintain um, the, the museum in an optimal condition so as to avoid future interventions. Um, of course, we have a very interesting tool which uh, is explained in the SDGs of the 2030 Agenda of the UN. As we all know, these are goals, these are objectives, uh, classified into 17 objective, objectives or groups of action, which are very ambitious and set by the UN. And they serve as, a, as an element which clearly justifies the need to integrate sustainability in our daily work. The SDGs are not reflected in the Spanish legislation. Uh, nevertheless, the European Commission has actually used these SDGs as the starting point for many European programs, which were later uh, established. The European Commission's uh, working programs always integrate the SDGs. The European Green Deal also integrates the SDGs. And basically, we've got the European Commission, which is, um, it is actually all of us. Um, their decisions are binding for Spain, since we are a member state. So um, we can understand that uh, we are actually bound by the European Commission's um, deals when it comes to considering the SDGs in all of our programs. Uh, the European Green Pact also has a very specific goal, which is um, decreasing CO2 emissions and turning that into European law. But, well, it is just an objective of the so-called European Green Pact. We all know that the SDGs are part of the 2030 Agenda and they are very much linked to culture. I think yesterday we heard something about the fact that there was not a specific uh, SDG related to culture or heritage protection, but actually if you look closer into these 179 uh, goals, actually some of them do refer to culture. These are targets uh, to be integrated in our daily work. For instance, a target Four, seven, cultural diversity, eight, nine, sustainable tourism. Yesterday we heard many examples about non-sustainable tourism, right? And then we've got the goal 1114 that I have highlighted because it says that we have to protect the world's cultural and natural heritage. 12.4, uh, which is about making a reasonable management of chemical products and wastes. Um, goal 13.2, integrating measures related to climate change in the national plans and strategies. So um, public administrations have actually been using and working on projects uh, related to these goals. And as you can see, culture, it is actually integrated as one of the mitigation measures of climate change. 
as I said earlier, sometimes we uh, are working with plans or projects. And in the Spanish Institute of Cultural Heritage, we take into account, well, in this case, there are 14, 14 pictures on the cover. Actually, we've got 15 national plans of cultural heritage. And these plans are drafted in collaboration with the Spanish government and the uh, regional governments together with public and private institutions. Uh, they talk about the cultural landscape, the Splanfo cathedrals, etc. And they follow a common methodology. I don't mean common between the plans, but common for all the administrations and managers. And it requires coordination, assessment, improvement, etc. There's something very interesting about the plans, which means that they are old, they began before 2000, but there is an implicit uh, relationship with the SDGs in the sense that obviously they, they were not mentioned as such because they had not been uh, drafted yet, but there is like an implicit relationship and there is a need to actually uh, preserve heritage for the future uh, without wasting, without squandering our heritage. At the IPCE, sustainability is very important. We have the so-called national plans, uh, including, for instance, the management of waste, uh, the use of sustainable products, the reduction of materials and emissions, the conservation of cultural landscapes. But we are also working a lot in, in the sense of uh, trying to find solutions for the various issues that arise in different cultural institutions. So we've got both sides. in order to try and improve sustainability in Spain. In 2021, um, a guideline was published in order to introduce the PING methodology for um, tangible assets. And this forces us to have a health and safety plan, a waste management plan, and an environmental management plan for all of the public tenders that we organize. This is uh, internally speaking. With regard to um, our outreach activities, we have a set of documents that we call the Corman manuals dedicated to different types of materials, such as stone, um, metals, bioheritage, etc. And they provide a set of methodologies and criteria. With regard to stone materials, there is a plan from 2012 which says that the actions should foster social, economic and environmental sustainability. So in 2012, we were already talking about sustainability, but maybe we we're not using exactly the same terminology. And certainly we didn't call it SDG because it had not been coined. At the bottom of the slide, you can read the, the harder the complexity of the intervention, the lower the sustainability. This is also part of the guideline on stone materials. This is just the idea for any type of uh, restoration action, and it should be borne in mind. Sometimes we have to tackle very complex projects, uh, but sometimes the, the more you intervene on the heritage, the, the more you reduce sustainability. So I wanted to give you now a few examples of the projects of the IPCE. I think we are improving our practices in these projects that I'm going to explain now, such as using a particular chemical substances.
One of the most interesting projects tackled by the IPCE with regard to biodegradation has to do with on-site anoxia processes. Um, here are some pictures of a paper from 1972 where people were spraying uh, the, the University Library of Barcelona and they were uh, spraying insect killer basically and you can see the, the spray bottles of insect killer which was extremely toxic and um, damaging for health and uh, you can see uh, the worker with his uh, personal protective equipment and they're actually uh, closing the library and uh, spraying it with six bottles of gas and then when they finish they, they leave Fortunately, this uh, insect killing procedure actually changed and people gave up doing that. Anoxia has to be uh, implemented very carefully. And thanks to our researcher from the IPCE, who is now retired, uh, this researcher came up with uh, a new working program, as if to say. Uh, Valentin uh, was the name of this researcher. Maybe you have heard about her. And she was uh, working back then at the Institute of Conservation of Cultural Properties, which is now called IPCE, and together with institutions from Sweden, Italy, United Kingdom, and Spain. They um, tackled a European program, a European project with the purpose of um, changing the anoxia methodology for insect killing. They also provided the ma ma material uh, devices such as barrier, plastics, uh, machinery, etc. So it's a type of insect killing which does not generate chemical waste because they're just using nitrogen. And nitrogen can be achieved by means of generators. And although there is a small carbon footprint, it's nothing compared to the former insect killing spraying methods that they used, like lindane which was often used in Galicia and caused a lot of trouble. Methyl, bromide, hydrogen cyanide, etc. All of those are totally banned substances in the EU, fortunately, because they're very toxic. So now uh, anoxia is one of the treatments uh, which are part of the UN um, norm for uh, pesculine which is actually something very important because it is part of the UNE uh, 16790. So among the, 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 the advantages of the anoxia study, it is not toxic at all. So well, we are talking about the environment, we're talking about people, and you can apply uh, the treatment as a preventive measure. Sometimes it's hard to justify a preventive measure using particular substances because actually you are uh, placing um, well you, you can damage objects you can damage assets etc but this type of treatment is totally uh, benign and harmless so well in in some very special collections you cannot afford to, to have uh, larvae of insects because maybe there is a fabric collection <laughs> and then th there are moths that get into the room and that will destroy your fabrics. So you can use it as a preventive measure, which is very interesting. It is uh, respectful with materials provided that we used uh, relative humidity and temperature conditions right but it is very easy to, to measure. 
So if you're working in a warehouse, it is very easy to measure humidity, temperature, etc. It is very versatile. You can use it for many different types of objects from mummies with all the complexity of mummies uh, containing um, biological tissue, bones, uh, you know, uh, bandages, or wax, etc. So from mummies to uh, musical instruments, books, etc. And in the pictures, you can actually, talking about the versatility of the use, you can uh, do the anoxia treatment to a book, or you can actually uh, wrap the shelves of a library and then do anoxia to the whole library. So it's very scalable. So uh, it's also uh, going to save you costs because you can do it in the institution itself with your own means and resources. So as I said, you can just work with a single volume because you are restoring that book or you're going to lend it to another museum, etc. Or you can even uh, do on-site anoxia for the whole library all of the bookshelves in a library and you do not depend on external companies you can do it yourself with your own resources that saves you money and also with regard to the, to, to the management of the institution it saves you money it saves you time and it makes it easier for the managers to organize a whole process it is also effective for all the um, life stages of insects and also insects from different species in one single treatment. Uh, we have practiced anoxia for um, um, religious sculptures with, uh, with, with lice and with moth, and you can kill them with just one single treatment. So you're treating at the same time a sculpture that has wood and has fabric. Now, this is very nice, isn't it? But well, I'm going to talk, to talk about the bad things because the Europe, Council of Europe has included nitrogen as an active substance or a biocide. And in 2012, the EU regulation uh, provides that you can only use biocides for particular uses. There's also a headline from Faro de Vigo, the, the journal, a newspaper rather, which says that the new EU regulation uh, stops one part of the museum because the anoxia chamber had to be uh, closed down. But apart from that, uh, particular problem. Uh, in 2018, there was a joint declaration by ICOM and ICOMOS, which tried to uh, somehow change the, the, the mindset of the European Commission, and they convinced them to make exceptions for nitrogen in the absence of alternatives. But the European Commission, you know, they're very stubborn. However, they said, well, there is an article in the regulation which provides for exceptions in the absence of alternatives, in the absence of a, a better treatment, and only for cultural heritage. So by uh, resorting to 55.3 of the regulation in 2019, Austria, Spain, and other member states began a procedure in order to uh, apply to the Commission and uh, get authorization for anoxia. So the European Commission made a public consultation and there were about 1,400 uh, comments sent to the European Union from individuals and from many institutions. And three of them actually were against. So in the end, it's just a, you know a letter of interest which explains that uh, well you need to apply anoxia because it's necessary for conservation purposes, and only there are three which were against. Um, because obviously, if anoxia is forbidden, then you're a company which provides a different treatment, so you can sell it. 
So that's how it went. But fortunately, in 2020, there was an execution uh, decision by the European Union allowing Spain, well, Austria, Spain, etc. They are uh, individual for each ME. So uh, it allows Spain to use uh, biocides with nitrogen prepared on site for the protection of cultural heritage until the last day of 2024. So we've got one year left. But so far, anoxia is allowed, provided that you uh, use a nitrogen generator. So you must have a nitrogen generator in the museum. You know it's expensive, but you can do it. And it requires man maintenance, by the way. But you can apply anoxia with uh, oxygen sequestration. This was never forbidden. And you can also practice anoxia with nitrogen if you buy it off the company which registered nitrogen in 2009 with a patent, with, with a, like, a, like a drug patent. However, you know, uh, the patent expired. So from 2022, anybody could apply for a new patent. I mean, to the European Chemistry Association to, to get a new patent for the, for the nitrogen. So if you're interested, you can do it. You can apply for that. Because actually, nitrogen is extremely interesting. In 2023, there is a decision by the ECHA, European Chemicals Agency, or rather the Committee of Experts of the ECHA, which uh, says that on-site generated nitrogen can be part of category two because it's a slightly toxic biocide, uh, because we are, we are all, you know, breathing nitrogen like 80% of air that we breathe is actually nitrogen. So it's so really harmless, to be honest. So, so once uh, the European Commission uh, integrates nitrogen in category two of Annex one, then it will be possible to have a simplified approval procedure. However, uh, so far it has not been approved. And uh, then institutions in the EU countries, for instance, the Spanish Ministry of Health, uh, could actually trigger the procedure. And once it is approved, it can be integrated in a, in a piece of law. And then we would be able to use on-site anoxia for uh, cultural heritage rather than uh, doing it as an exception with a deadline, which is December 2024. So as soon as this is made, any EU member state can do something called mutual recognition and uh, they can just uh, ratify their anoxia procedure within 30 days. I don't know if the Spanish Ministry of Health is going to go for that. But uh, I actually hope that other EU member states will apply for that and achieve it. And thanks to the simplified procedure and mutual acknowledgement, as it is called, probably next year we will be able to apply anoxia. Another methodology which is sustainable in this case uh, has, uh, which has to be applied to the Seville Cathedral, is the preventive conservation of the Seville Cathedral, the one in the picture. It's a historical monument. It's very well known. It, it has like two million visitors a year. And since I mean, it was completed in 1506. So for uh, five centuries, the cathedral went through a process of deterioration. 
and it requires continuous maintenance. So since 2000, the IPCE and the cathedral chapter have been working on a preventive uh, measures plan, focusing on the, especially on the Renaissance facade. It is an example of uh, sustainable methodology because we are uh, bringing together the three components, social, environmental, and economic. And the, the yearly maintenance costs are much lower, around 10 times lower than the costs, the actual costs of a restoration intervention. So it's actually much cheaper to, to, to apply an ongoing maintenance. The methodology uh, has to do with a monthly uh, monitoring process, uh, noting down incidents, and then there's an annual follow-up and an annual maintenance, which is done with cranes, allowing the, the restoration team to reach the, the top of the cathedral. So um, every portal has a map of vulnerability indicators or uh, control points, which determines the vulnerability of each of the elements, the architectural elements. So there is an annual uh, monitoring process for a week, and there is a maintenance process, which is done once a year. So for instance, we have um, we have gotten rid of a particular substance that was damaging the portals. Uh, it was a substance that was applied during the 90s and it was uh, eliminated. Uh, we have used a, a particular type of uh, soft mortar in areas of high erosion. And we have also gotten rid of ethyl silicate and we make uh, specific consolidations <coughs> with lime water, which is quite sustainable. And we have repaired and, and maintained drain pipes <laughs> in order to avoid water dripping down the facade. <laughs> so we have uh, also tried to modify the, the drain pipes and avoiding uh, water leaking down walls where it can be hurting the facade. And we are also replacing biocides like biotin R with ethanol, 70% reinforced with 0.1% benzalkonium chloride. We have also replaced herbicides, the glyphosate, so we have been replacing glyphosate uh, with acetic acid, which is uh, giving very good results for uh, getting rid of weeds, particularly those weeds that grow in between the architectural elements. We have also avoided uh, pigeons from uh, nesting there by using an electrostatic system and uh, as well as uh, the lesser kestrel. These birds actually uh, cause a lot of trouble, not only in Seville, but also in the whole of Spain because they, they generate a lot of feces and that makes the facades very dirty. So we have been uh, using a predator bird, which scares the pigeons away. Actually, I think that uh, last year there was not a single pigeon nest on the cathedral. However, something is positive, which is that we have gotten rid of pigeons, but we have uh, gotten some nests of Pencejo pallido, which is a native species, the Apus pallidus, and it's a very uh, positive bird, which enhances the biodiversity. It's a type of swift uh, that enhances the biodiversity of the fauna around the cathedral. So this is a positive uh, event. 
um, given that the, the, I mean, the pigeon nesting has decreased. However, there are like 40 new nests of swifts that have to be taken care of. Obviously, swifts also uh, generate the tritus, but we can apply meshes. We can uh, protect the facade with, with, with nets and meshes so as to avoid uh, the bird's feces from spoiling the facade. Uh, something interesting that we have done about that, too, is that continuing with the protection of the of the swift and the kestrel, we have changed the maintenance period, which used to be done in the springtime. But you know that birds are um, nesting in springtime, so now we are doing maintenance in autumn in, rather than doing it in the springtime. Apart from maintaining the portals with a preventive set of measures, which is actually very interesting, we have applied other actions on the cathedral, such as the, the, the cleaning and stabilization of the cement, the natural and Portland cement, on a series of sculptures by Berbel, which were made in the 19th century, which were uh, a bit uh, damaged. So we are um, preserving and restoring those sculptures by Velver, and we are also studying uh, consolidating agents in cement uh, probes. So we are trying ethyl silicate and a bioconsolidant, which is called UGR, that was mentioned by Marta. Um, made by a company linked to the University of Granada. And we're also working with lime water. Uh, we do not have like definite outcomes, but I can tell you that after one year, the lime water is giving the best results because it does not change the color of the stone. We have also uh, carried out different actions uh, on a set of works carried out in 2013 to 2018. These are sustainable interventions on stone sculptures. These are sculptures which are, which are scattered around the gardens surrounding the cathedral. There is like a um, sculpture by Sorolla, a uh, number of sculptures from the Malaga Museum, uh, which were outdoors. There's also a stone bench at the Botanical Garden. There's a sculpture from the Lazaro Galdiano Museum. And uh, one thing which uh, is shared by all these interventions is the fact that we avoid uh, using biocides, and we are cleaning with um, laser. So this is a green type of cleaning. We are using lime water, also with mortar of lime and sand. We are using 70% alcohol with 0.1% benzalkonium chloride, and uh, well, sometimes there is uh, a need for uh, doing consolidation with lime water, as I said. So what I basically wanted to show you is that this sculpture here on top is the final status of uh, the intervention. So we've got some very good results just using uh, wheat, I mean, alcohol as a wheat killer uh, combined with green cleaning systems. So at the same time, it requires continuous maintenance. We are also preparing some research in order to test uh, metallic nanomaterials against biodegradation. Uh, this has not been very much tested in the field, although they have carried out in vitro tests. But it's something that we would really like to test, the use of metallic nanomaterials. Uh, we're also doing air quality studies, which is our 
It's very important for biodegradation. You know that the environmental burden is actually going to determine whether we can, uh, whether, uh, you know, spores or fungi could uh, deposit on indoor objects. So I just wanted to show you how we have uh, done a research into the quality of the air in this chapel of Luis de Lucena that has some amazing frescoes. You cannot see them very well, but it is called the 16th Chapel of Guadalajara. So they were affected by uh, humidity and we practice an intervention in order to improve the, the airing of the chapel, which is something very simple. It was very, very tight, I mean, close tight, and we just open it a bit to clean air, and we managed to reduce the, the, the concentration of microorganisms in the air. Uh, then we propose a methodology which is not quite uh, fully tested, but we will try and test it in the field. Like we want to try it in archives, in uh, warehouses of different institutions, and in the, 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 the library of the institution, for instance. Uh, we also want to use uh, natural antimicrobial agents, which comes from a project of the National Plan of Research into Conservation using natural products. Um, this finished in 2014 with some positive results, uh, such as using the essence of Artemisia absinthum which seems to have an antimicrobial activity. It's an antimicrobial agent. However, this uh, project uh, was completed in 2014 because it was a collaboration with Botanical Garden and it's now over. But in 2021, there was a, a workshop on restoration of paper. And we, we took that course and then we did some experiments with clove. With, with cooking clove and um, we applied starch, we applied all J um, jelly, pamriac jelly, food jelly basically, sturgeon jelly and we realized that if you add clove which is very rich in eugenol which is a microbiocide it actually inhibits the growth of microorganisms in these natural agents. And, well, uh, with regard to methodology, there is um, a, an interesting uh, research which was done on a collection of 22,000 coins. They were iron coins. They are not very worthy in themselves, but it's a, a good field of study for researchers so that they can carry out tests. So it's interesting about this test that they were stabilized in 2013. They got rid of corrosion, but of course you cannot uh, monitor 22,000 coins. So what they did is to do an stratigraphic sampling method. They, they use a UNE ISO norm of industrial assessment and um, based on some calculations that you can see on the screen, uh, basically if you want a risk of 8% of the material being uh, impacted by whatever, then you need to do a control study in which you take 80 coins as a sample. So then you, you, you just extract 80 coins, you scan them, and you take a black and white picture in order to test corrosion. You just uh, eliminate the red channel and you only look at the um, black and white picture and then you set an alarm threshold. In this case, this is 3%. And the positive thing is that if you observe 
upon subsequent inspections that the status of the collection does not uh, get worse. You can decide to reduce the sample size or you can decide to, uh, to, to do it more periodically or less periodically, depending on the status. So that makes your, your work more efficient. And just to finish, uh, a very interesting work carried out in the monastery of St. Mary of Paula, which belongs to the Ministry of Culture. And this is a beautiful, spectacular setting uh, close to Madrid. It has an altar piece made of alabaster. It has a choir, a whole collection of Carluccio's paintings in the cloister. And uh, we're actually monitoring the biodegradation with traps, because there is an area in, in this part of the altar piece from the 18th century, which is made basically of stone and wood. It's a very tall altar piece in a very narrow uh, setting, looking like a tower. So it's very tall and narrow. It is very difficult to access. And we are setting tramps and doing a monthly monitoring of uh, whatever falls into that trap in order to make a catalog of insects fallen into the traps. And then we analyze what type of insects are uh, threatening the choir and the altarpiece and the sculptures. So we are following uh, some cleaning protocols, setting trams, and using non-chemical methods. And we also want to remove the modern wood that could be deteriorated because there is an infection vector. This is a map of the traps that were set. So we basically uh, set the traps there and then we uh, check upon them. We have found in the traps a lot of moth, larvae, etc. And uh, now we've got some um, control points for Anobium punctatum. We have also found some field insects, which means that the windows are not completely closed. We have found many uh, moths and dermestids that were not detected earlier and which are flying around the whole monastery. And basically, we are trying to modify the control points so as to avoid having 60 points, which are too many, and to reduce the number of the control points to make our, to make our job more effective. Also at the monastery, at the same monastery, we are carrying out a project uh, belonging to Iperion with the University College London uh, with the purpose of developing tools in order to make preventive uh, conservation. Uh, this is being done next to the Carduccio's oil paintings, 56 oil paintings measuring nine square meters each done in 1626 which were scattered after uh, deamortization and are now collected in the monastery. It's a beautiful collection. So what we do is basically to, to catch dust by, by these um, boxes uh, where we, um, we, we compile the dust. We leave it there for a few days, like 30 days. And then we analyze, we take pictures of each of the boxes, each of the doors, and then we subdivide each image into nine squares because, because well, the, the photography had a lot of pignetting, which was causing trouble. And then we run it through an image recognition software, open source software, and then we we count and we calculate the area and then we make a dust deposition model, which is going to be published next in a paper in 2024. And just to finish, I think it's very important uh, to have this green book for the sustainable management of cultural heritage that we saw yesterday. And Alejandro talked about that yesterday. And the ministry is involved in that. And one of the legs of the ministry is the IPC, where I'm working. 
and the Institute has also collaborated in that green book. Well, that's all. Uh, this work is a joint work in which many people have collaborated. So um, these are all the papers where uh, we have taken part. And I don't want to read them, but you've got some bibliography containing all of the co-authors. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, it is 12.22, 12, so we're going to move on to the next presentation of today. We have here today with us Patricia San Martin Sanchez, who is a member of the Environmental Studies Group. This is applied to cultural and natural heritage at the University of Vincent Compostela. It is as an associated researcher at the CRETUS, the Cross Disciplinary Research Center in Environmental Technologies. The presentation is entitled Green and Sustainable Methodologies Applied to Stone uh, Heritage, uh, Current Interventions in Santiago de Compostela. She has a degree in chemistry, so I hand over the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so in line with what uh, Hector has touched upon, we're going to be talking about green and sustainable methodologies in uh, stone heritage, and especially I'm going to be focusing on the work that has been done in Santiago de Compostela in this uh, realm. Uh, Santiago de Compostela is the capital of Galicia, and it's been world heritage since 1985, as you know. So in the first uh, slide, I've included a picture of Vanita Silva Hermo, who you will know, most of you. She was my mentor. I worked with her uh, from 2005 to 2021, one year before her uh, death. She uh, got sick in 2021 and she died in 2022. Pontevedra reminds me of her very much. I've just been talking to some colleagues in the last few days about this. It was here at the School of Conservation and Restoration where I heard about her for the first time. I remember that back then I was cooperating with the Galician uh, Center for Contemporary Art and I went for a coffee with a friend and they told me, why don't you go to Pontevedra and do your PhD dissertation there? Why don't you talk to Benny Silva. That was June 2005, and I started working with her in October 2005, and since then for 16 years. I think that Benny is a very important figure in terms of the conservation of uh, monumental uh, heritage in Galicia, and as and she was um, a great researcher and even a better person. So I'd like to pay tribute to her here today. Okay, let's focus on that presentation. So in line with what I read for the uh, abstract that I prepared, we all know that for a uh, European, for a European project, the European framework for uh, monument conservation projects has to be based on four main pillars conservation on biodiversity, adaptation to climate change, the green compact and circular economy. All of them are embedded, are to be embedded uh, in one term, which is one concept, which is sustainability. We need things to be sustainable uh, so that we can work today in the best uh, conditions possible without ruining the future, the, fu the, the future resources. And uh, also, uh, to this definition that's been taken from well literature, we could add uh, and do this by, I mean, not uh, damaging the environment. Rodrigo Florita mentioned this also. These are just words from words to facts or to actions or to the things that can be actually implemented. Well, there is a big distance. So this is like a background framework. But having this as such doesn't mean that we can always follow that direction. Hector has talked about anoxia a lot, which is a great method. But anoxia, for example, for a monument such as the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela of the Monastery of uh, St. Martin Penaria, that's not possible. So uh, uh, there is another thing in this regard. One thing is what studies uh, claim. Sometimes they ask you, what do we do with this um, monument? Do we take away moss or what do we do? 
uh, there is a multidisciplinary group that is, uh, I mean, the, word, the good thing would be to have a, a, a physician, a physicist who says something from his field and has some light and then the, 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 the chemi, chem, chemistry expert and then it's like a suicide episode and then you conclude and agree on a solution. It doesn't happen like that. There are contradictions and um, also dissent among different people from different fields and uh, eventually you end up having a solution. For example, you decide not to eliminate this moss colonization because uh, you might have, well, biodegradation and often the organism effect is by a protector, so you decide not to eliminate it, but then the authorities come or the responsible uh, bodies and they decide that they want to eliminate this lichen um, um, uh, layer. So this is an example because well, it's a case in point for what I have just said. Whenever we have a jubilee year in Santiago de Compostela, well, the city gets ready for it. So uh, in the last um, jubilee year, 2021-2022, there was a, a project uh, with the cooperation of many companies to restore the facades of the cathedral. If we had an iconic uh, jubilee year, it was the 1993 one with that um, um, Pellegrin uh, mascot and it was like the greatest uh, jubilee year ever. So there was a great uh, work that was conducted in those days in the cathedral to restore it. So here we can see on the facade of the Abradoiro Square, which used to have uh, some sort of uh, orange color due to the type of lichen that uh, you can find there. So Garcia Marquez wrote on it, and in general he wrote about how nature found its way on the monuments of uh, Compostela. But if you look at this, and you look at the measure that did need to be uh, done, uh, well, it says that lichens and moss are going to be maintained because they're already dead and they uh, sort of, uh, well, protect the materials against water. So this is a situation where more often than not, you have to, uh, um, uh, well, consider there are people who are starting to work uh, on this uh, are in their 20s. So this is a very common situation. You have some patents and then they establish a framework for work and then they decide to eliminate this lichen layer and well they try to do things uh, so that um, the damage that they cause is miti miti mitigated. So I am more and more uh, interested in not turning my back uh, on um, colonization of uh, this type of lichens or moss. So I need I think that we need to strike a balance between colonization and stone heritage as much as possible and we need to work on that. And this is something I took from the website of Hader Weiss, is a researcher from Oxford University that I've cooperated with a couple of times. And she has a fourth line of work, which is uh, finding a balance between biodiversity and heritage and their preservation. In this regard, I'm going to be talking about uh, preservation of biodiversity, that when we talk about biodiversity, and this happens to me too, we always think uh, about uh, uh, wildlife, but just animals and not plants. And this happens to me too. When I uh, say, let's uh, conserve or preserve biodiversity, uh, I always think this type of process, what is going to happen with organisms, uh, insects, coleopterous, lepidopterous, etc. And we never think about the plants, which is also a part of biodiversity. There is one thing that is called botanic blindness or vegetable blindness. And there's this teacher at the University of Santiago Compostela who always shows a picture of a kitchen, a chicken in a field surrounded by plants and nobody sees the plants. So people just talk about chicken, the chicken. So there is that part sort of blindness towards a, um, plants. So Heather uses plants or tries to use plants in the best possible way for fostering preservation. So on this image we can see a Vicul rupestri which is a plant on the top 
part of the um, uh, wall, and then two types of lichen, Chantoria paretina, which is very common in both Galicia and the UK, and Ocroqueria parella. So these lichens are a good example of that dichotomy in terms of biodegradation, bioconservation. There is a great debate on whether we should eliminate lichens or not. On the one hand, they generate oxalic acids. They excrete them. This damage a lot of rock materials, uh, granite, for example, and also other uh, uh, minerals. But on the other hand, they have a cohesive power on rocks and often, and we've seen this in case studies, when they are eliminated, the rock sort of loses cohesion. As uh, Marta has already said, it's like it turns into dust uh, when you touch it, it's like flour. So it's a critical decision to make, eliminating lichens or not. And then plants can be some sort of a support, especially for the top part of walls. The other picture has been taken from a book. Uh, but it's uh, from uh, a study by Heather Biles again. So that type of uh, vegetation on the top part of the, the upper part of the walls is like an umbrella. It's a support that uh, stops a greater biodeterioration from happening uh, due to chemical agents and their impact on the materials. So we need to bring together the grey parts and the mm, green part, to put it like that, the stone part and the biological part. This picture has been taken from a book by Eduardo Veras, who's somebody I talk to very often. He's published two books. One is The Fountains of Santiago de Compostela, and the other one is The Colors of Santiago de Compostela. It's just been published. And this book, or this picture, dates back to uh, 1866. It's been taken from the Fountain book. So here we can see two things, and we can have our own perspective depending on our professional realm, so we can see different things depending on that. So Eduardo shows this picture to say that there is a, uh, a strong chromophobia in uh, Compostela, color phobia. Everything that was painted is there, but they don't want it to be painted again. So this is the Prateria, the Praterias Square, and you can see that the woman on the fountain representing, uh, I mean, the, the horses representing Santiago de Compostela was painted in white. and. Uh, there is a, a bronze star that was painted in gold. That is not so today. I'm going to show you a, a, a picture from nowadays of the of this square. So I think that there is a stone city, Santiago de Compostela, that has had an impact on the society. So. I always ask my students to distinguish between the good and bad things of eucalyptus and the urban myths that are associated with eucalyptus. And it is like, uh, well, we blame eucalyptus for everything. Uh, there are things that are attributed to eucalyptus that are not true. So I like this because I have a project that I'm going to talk about uh, now that is called uh, Botanic pavement for Santiago de Compostela that is about uh, growing plants, small plants on the pavement. And I always show this picture because, well, this idea that Santiago is a stone city and that you can't have any plants on. Uh, uh, on cracks or anything, well, this is not um, true. I mean, and before we had an invasion of pilgrims, when clearly there was not so many people in Santiago de Compostela, and in this square, the square of Praterias in particular, you can see that this type of plants, uh, well, were growing in uh, the stone cracks, pavement cracks. So. In connection with this, I would like to say that often uh, biological colonization is a part of heritage. And I would like to uh, give the example of the San Pinario, San Martino Pinario uh, monastery. I've written on this and on the interest that how interesting its biological colonization is and how interesting it is to look at the way that. Uh, um, life finds its way in the ministry and how organisms are actually resilient and adapt to the environment in incredible ways. So this uh, is connected to the fact that biofilm 
was sort of making a drawing on the mm, wall that resembles uh, waves. So I thought that this had to have some sort of explanation because uh, is a clear a growth pattern that has to respond to some reasons. And some people said, well, uh, this is just because, uh, well, they just uh, claim this to that uh, spot and that's the explanation. So I talked to the uh, vice chancellor uh, and the person in charge of the uh, cloister and he said that he always remembered it like that. I mean, he said that it had always had that shape. So we analyzed this and we found an object that is Paptococcus lobacus, which is ubiquitous. Uh, so this alga, algae, that you can find on, for example, uh, light pasts uh, and it grows on uh, cement. So I've conducted a number of studies with Heather in Oxford and we found this type of, um, well, plant. Uh, so it grows in the shape of biofilm generating a layer of polysaccharides. So here, that matrix has a uh, waterproof uh, or uh, properties, water repellent properties. And to make this even better, uh, to avoid trying uh, adverse effects, this grows on the part of the world that is not exposed to um, sunlight. And this is because it's occupying that part of the world only. And this is a video that I hope uh, it's going to work properly. Okay, here we can see we are sort of uh, putting, uh, pouring uh, water on the um, biofilm, and as you can see, it's uh, water repellent. It's not, it doesn't get wet. It is totally waterproof, and this has been generated by the algae themselves. So as you can see, here we took some measurements and the drop is not absorbed at all. So I'm telling this because, well, I hesitate to tell you about my point of view, but this is a form of heritage also. If we eliminate this biofilm on the cloister of St. Martin Penario is a mistake uh, from my point of view. This is a part of the heritage. And we have published some paper with uh, Francesca Scapitelli working group in Italy. And she said that, uh, well, uh, th this uh, paper was her favorite because it was very original. So uh, she thought that this was something that people uh, needed to know. So this is about what I said before about bringing together stone and biology. Uh, I would like to talk about Jose Maria Cabrera also, who was the person who has worked the most with the cathedral and with the uh, Praterias Square, which is also an area that I have studied a lot. So Jose Maria Cabrera says that the first time he went to uh, Santiago Compostela was in 1961. So that picture dates back to the 1960s. It's been taken from one of Jose Maria Cabrera's book, so, books. So there was a lot of damp or a lot of humidity there. And that can be seen on the right part of the image. So he conducted a study in 1961. He presented his PhD dissertation in 1962. A good part of his dissertation focused on this facade in Pretoria Square, and he was one of the coordinators of this restoration that I've already mentioned from 90 to 98 in the cathedral. So in this restoration, he made a decision that was on this part of the facade, he placed uh, um, bronze uh, or brass uh, leaves, uh, bronze is an alley of, uh, well, uh, uh, well, bronze and brass, well, both of them have copper in them, so copper is a biocide, as we all know, so on this part of the facade, he placed some layers, some leaves of brass 
or uh, bronze containing uh, copper. So he managed to make it look like this today, the facade in Puerto Rios Square. It's been cleaned. I've worked on this. Uh, I mean, colonization was not very uh, significant here. So this has changed. This has changed uh, the colonization pattern a lot. Here he tells us about, uh, well, what he does now. He plants olive trees nowadays, as we can see in this picture, which is a uh, uh, current picture. So he uh, did this, and I have my own theory, which is that the solution was right there. We didn't need to take it from a book, and this is something I show to my uh, students uh, often why this pattern change why is there no uh, biological colonization on this part of the fountain and on the other side of the fountain there is none and people say students say tend to say that this is because of the wind but the thing is that the star is made out of bronze and it has an hydraulic system, an incredible hydraulic system, whereby this, uh, the different, well, tips of the star, uh, there is water coming out of them. This is a uh, very difficult to maintain to stop it from rust, getting rusty. So when it rains, the bronze is washed. And as we have already said, it's got uh, copper in it. So the water pours down the arm of the woman representing Santiago de Compostela and everything is washed. And that stops uh, colonization from appearing there, from happening there. Whereas on the other side of the fountain, this does not happen. And therefore, there is colonization. So what is right, what is wrong, understanding things to be able to appreciate them and to understand how perception changes in terms of what is a good restoration, what is a bad restoration. Also in the 1990s, an important uh, cleaning uh, process was uh, carried out in the Tui Cathedral and when it uh, ended, it looked so new that there were people, people who criticized this uh, because there was this layer that gave uh, a specific character to the artwork and a lot of people thought that it didn't make any sense. And I'm showing this because if my grandmother uh, ha was still alive, she would never understand why a wall would be left like this, showing this part of the world. And there is no uh, additional layer on it, a plaster layer. Uh, people uh, tended to uh, prefer uh, layers of plaster all over the place, especially in houses that have been rehabilitated or renovated. I mean, people tend to like other <laughs> types of things. So I could give uh, uh, 40 or uh, examples of things like this regarding what the people tend to prefer and uh, what is the uh, beauty ideal in terms of how to present this type of walls or facades. And let me now move on to the project that we have carried out. Uh, this one is uh, Botanic Pavement. Um, I've co-headed this uh, project. This is a project that is connected to botanics and preservation. So I would like to tell you the story behind this project. This started because Angel Panera from the Santiago Consortium had to uh, uh, authorize this uh, census that we were going to install for um, temperature and humidity. So he said that, uh, well, Lourdes this was going to be there, but he did some changes. So Angel told me, uh, well, some things happened during the pandemic and I've been thinking about this uh, for a long time. And uh, I just wanted to ask you whether you want to be in charge of this project. So he said that at the beginning of the pandemic, he, they would go to uh, look at their works and she I mean, he uh, walked up the stairs of the Quintana Square and from the staircase, he looked at Quintana dos Mortos and it looked like uh, um, a field of grass. And he went up there and he realized the colonization 
had grown on the uh, cracks of the pavement uh, uh, stones. So he said that if we could uh, replicate this in other squares and try to uh, uh, find that concept of uh, a stone city and try to strike a balance between biology and stone. So he used the uh, Spanish metrics, which is football pitches. So he said that this could be as big as three uh, football pitches in terms of grass, and this could <coughs> totally change the city. And I agreed, so I formed a cross-disciplinary group to carry out this project. But, uh, well, the first reaction was not very good <laughs> because people started uh, saying that this would be uh, dangerous because you would trip uh, uh, if you were uh, walking there, you could fall, and it was going to be slippery. So Miguel published a Twitter. He published a tweet during a heat wave that we had in Galicia, which is not very common in Galicia. So he po posted this message, this tweet, showing uh, via a thermal camera the dif temperature difference between the stones and the uh, plants. So he said that, well, um, these uh, plants are some sort of allies to keep the um, temperature down. So that small part of green that we were introducing in the city would contribute to uh, cool the air down. So this tweet was uh, retweeted uh, very often. And we the other day we went to ask for financing for the third part of the botanic uh, pavement project. And Yago Lestegas from the uh, town council of Santiago de Compostela, he said that he had retweeted this message and this was retweeted also uh, by somebody from the town council of London. And this helped us to uh, give an impetus to the project. So here we have Pablo Rodeiro on the image to the right. So they are introducing the plants that have been selected after creating an inventory of the plants that uh, grow uh, spontaneously. So we selected the most resilient plants. So it is not inventing the wheel, really. Ignacio Bosch came to Santiago recently, you probably know him, and well, he said that this had been being done for a while then, and something I would like to highlight is that often it is not about reinventing the wheel. As Rodrigo Florita said yesterday, well, we knew about uh, greenhouse uh, effect, and then we had a Nobel Prize being given in connection with this. So uh, the same thing happens with WhatsApp. I mean, it's had a different name. So there's been uh, previous uh, applications that were very similar, but they were not as successful as uh, WhatsApp. Also, colonization happens in a way that we can see here also in Pontevedra. But this is artificial plants, as Sonia is saying, so it doesn't apply. But here on these images, uh, well, I always encourage everybody to go see them because you can see a picture or a graph, but it's not the same. So the Fonterrabia Square is uh, on the picture, and this project has been implemented there, so why don't you go there and have a look? So this is the part of the square where no plants have been introduced, and then on the right, the part with plants that have been introduced. Okay, this is another project that is called Bioshen. 
in the Santa Maria de Concho monastery. So there is a, a pathology registered there, which is called humid darkening. And we don't really know what is the reason behind this. So we can see that the environmental humidity is 80%. So where we have this uh, surface uh, darkening, uh, humidity is 100%, while in clearer areas or lighter areas, humidity is 80%. This means that there must be a water condensation there on the surface. That means that humidity goes up. Uh, apart from this, the darkened areas had a very high nitrate concentration. So we uh, consider the possibility of having nitrificating bacteria generating this nitrate. So a colleague of mine who is a biologist, a conservator, uh, conducted a biocleaning on the surface and the situation improved, but this continued generating this. So we thought that the problem should be much greater and that probably there was a circle, some sort of a wheel, which never stops. And by looking at the number of analyses and by taking a number of samples, we uh, concluded that the catalyst was the bitumen that had been applied on the surface of the uh, monastery in the previous year. This is some sort of a tar. This bitumen is some sort of a tar that used to be used in, in uh, areas with uh, high humidity levels such as uh, um, the United Kingdom, Santiago Compostela, and so parts of the north of France. So this, uh, well, was uh, considered to be good in the 19th century. So it was a way to sort of um, preserve the stone. But this tar uh, is something that you can really um, clean, uh, that you can take it away from there. We can use uh, biological or chemical methods to do this. And we, first of all, tried the easiest method. But at the end of the day, it's very difficult to take away, to eliminate this type of uh, task. So Bioshen deals with this. The starting point is to look at the strains that can actually be useful to clean. There are Pseudomonas and Chiodomonas. And as Ranali has uh, proved, Pseudomonas is Tutseri, which is a strain that works really well. It is not the same to use it with a monument where it is already having an, a, 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 an action than buying it. So if you take it from a place where it's already there, where you have a xenobiotic and it is already acting on this, then it's going to have a functionality that the strain that you buy does not have. So but, uh, since there was some uh, operations being conducted on the uh, facade of this building in the Abradora Square in Santiago de Compostela, this uh, is a building that houses the town hall of uh, um, uh, Santiago de Compostela. So this picture on the left takes back to 1888, and the other one, it's a nowadays picture. So we can see that that coloring in the central part of the building uh, has sort of been lost, that white color to coloring. So I send my students to take some samples. So if we can isolate bacteria strains that are actually growing, then they're going to be robust and they have a cleaning potential for xenobiotics. So this is the results um, and we're going to, uh, well, continue working on this. So these are the uh, uh, steps. Uh, if you do a proper sampling, the project is going to be successful. But if you, we have doubts, I always say we need to sample, uh, to take samples first. And then there is an adaptation to microorganisms, which is also important. As I said, they need to be sort of trained, as Pilar says. They have to be trained and prepared. So we retrain them in the lab, and we encourage them to grow in Erlen Meyer bottles with uh, oligotrophic uh, growing uh, uh, um, means. 
and then we uh, help it get accustomed to the environment and we modulate them too. So the idea is to mix uh, techniques because often with bio cleaning, uh, when you clean uh, significant coatings of xenobiotic uh, content, this is complicated. So the idea is to introduce other options such as uh, laser cleaning. That is something that we're going to do with a group of Iago Pozo at the University of Vigo. Gels, and we're going to cooperate with Piero Baglioni and Marta showed some uh, of his studies and he's uh, the father of uh, green gels in Europe to a certain extent. This is my third project in uh, monument lighting. It's called uh, the Fontes project with uh, financing by the Galician government. So what we did was to add uh, an additional component, which is the effect of the adjacent vegetation on the uh, potential biodegradation of the fountains. And I uh, took the six fountains of this part of Santiago de Compostela uh, so that you can see in the image. So it's uh, granite and marble. The one on the top left is uh, the one that is made out of marble. Two of these fountains, number four and number six, were built in the 1970s, and they were built because they were similar to the Paradise Fountain, which is the first fountain that was built in Santiago de Compostela back in 1122. And it is mentioned in the Codex Calixtinus. And it is uh, said that uh, pilgrims would arrive to Santiago and swim in there, that it had room for 21 pilgrims. So there are some controversy on this, whether this is original or not, because if you read the texts from those days, uh, well, the phantom was supposed to be much bigger than the one that we have nowadays. And I also wanted to add these three fountains. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, said that I had to include this, and he is really crazy about making that star and that water pouring star uh, and making it work again. So on this picture, we can see that pattern that I've already mentioned. The Quintana fountain is very interesting. The legend tells that um, some nuns just uh, needed to pay some debt at some point and said, OK, you can take the fountain. Um, so the idea is to look at the effects of lighting and vegetation. So this is related with uh, results that we have from previous uh, results, the I4 editage which is the first one I did with uh, laboratory tests. And uh, I work with uh, green, red, and blue. So what is the use of a number of wavelengths to avoid the growth of uh, phototropes? in connection with light. So this is like eating fiber. If you eat fiber, this is not going to give you any nutrients. But if you, with a photographer's organism, absorbing chlorophyll and other components, if you uh, establish a link between this uh, absorption spots and you introduce light in the gaps where there is no uh, sunlight exposure, what you are doing is you are applying light on this area, but you are stopping the growth of uh, phototrophers, which need light to grow. So this is the, like the first principle of the project that I am uh, carrying out with uh, lighting of monuments. So the idea has been taken from Clara Urthi uh, works in caves. They showed that in the case of uh, bacteria with blue light, you would 
get some sort of uh, uh, you would manage to stop the growth of that type of microorganism but I've taken this to outside monuments because in a cave you can just uh, put blue lighting but in a monument you can't uh, avoid the sunlight so we need to combine the number of hours that we are going to apply and how to stress organisms but in a positive way and to make that some sort of an aging uh, treatment. So this is like palliative uh, care for aging to put it like that. So we have had very good results and that are very good for biodiversity too. So these are the first tests that we conducted. Green and red were the colors that worked best. So we continued working with them later on. So that was the first project. The second project was uh, a different in dimension. The Santiago authorities took this idea and applied it to a smart city project that they had that is called the Smart Tiago that has three pillars, waste, mobility and lighting. So this Chroma Lux was the uh, part, the lighting part of that project. This is the Casa do Cabildo, which is in uh, Praterias Square also with the lighting. And these are the results. Since I only have five minutes left, I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit uh, on them, but this information is available on our website with the results of that project. This is in Pazo de Rajoy. Uh, this is a pilot that I promoted because I was being asked to place uh, lights on uh, the monuments, but I could only use the chroma lux option. So I could only do the type of tests that I wanted to do by comparing this with the lighting that has been used in Santiago Compostela with white light and with no light at all. And this is something that I could do at this uh, courtyard in uh, Pata de Rajoy because I had more margin for light. So what you can see in number five is with no lighting, number six is chroma looks, and seven is uh, using the lighting that we have in Stegon at the moment. And uh, in these images, we can see that there is less um, colonization with chroma looks than with the current solution. This is the same, but uh, represented graphically. And this is the study that we did with nine different types of insects and we can see that the chromalog solution has a uh, lower impact compared to the impact of the ornamental light of Santiago de Compostela that has been currently used. So we can see the different impacts on biodiversity of the different solutions on that image. And well, the same, uh, it can be seen on the following slide with graphs. And uh, that's my final slide. So you can see here the signature of Vilgeira Valverde, who has done a lot for the Pontevedra Museum. Since my father lived in, in Pontevedra for many years, he has asked me to include this uh, image as a final slide, but just like uh, Lycans, uh, Figueira Valverde involves some different opinions or leads to some different opinions. Always a bit controversial. Thank you very much for your attention. She is a researcher at the research group for the sustainable management and intervention on cultural heritage at the University of Valencia and she's a member of the research group for the um, sustainable management and intervention of uh, cultural uh, heritage. So she's going to be talking about advances in the study of eco-sustainable gases for the cleaning by uh, deep freezing of heritage surfaces. First of all, uh, let me thank you for having invited me to this seminar. It's a great pleasure to be able to share with all of you this project uh, where my dissertation is framed. I'm not working by myself. It's a group of researchers from the Polytechnic coming from various departments. So I'm going to share with you what it is all about. 
but I would like to start by defining the cleaning process. I think that uh, Marta has actually made an introduction to that, but I would like to highlight that it's a delicate process. It's also controversial often, and it's uh, totally invasive and irreversible. For those of you who are not involved in restoration, it's about uh, th uh, thinning different strata on the surface of the work that do not uh, we don't want to preserve. So there are different strata of various types, as we have seen in the previous um, talk, and there are also many different cleaning processes that are currently used, but which are also very controversial. So we are looking for the way to actually be able to remove the possibility of using, for instance, solvents, which sometimes seems to be impossible. So let's see how we can look for alternative solutions. This uh, research began with this study uh, of cryogenic cleaning, <laughs> which is similar to deep freezing cleaning. But this is a starting point, and it is part of mechanical cleaning techniques such as sand blasting or ultrasound cleaning. So we organize a table, uh, although, of course, mechanical cleaning and, um, and solvents cleaning are not comparable, but there are points such as secondary residue, etc., which actually allow understanding how, how precise a cleaning procedure is going to be for each stratum. So you can actually read my final uh, PhD dissertation in 2021. So uh, basically cryogenic cleaning uh, seems to be a residue-free um, technique because there is a sublimation of the projectile and there is no secondary residue, which is very important, particularly when you are using jellyfied uh, solvents. And this is uh, going to be solved. Moreover, it is a safe, relatively safe type of uh, cleaning, provided you wear uh, individual protective equipment. It is also efficient because according to studies, 77% of the cleaning times have been reduced. But these are mainly industrial studies, and we need to find out if this is also true for heritage cleaning. However, I think it's going to be difficult to reach sad, such accurate figures. And it's also a sustainable method because it reuses uh, solid CO2. So how sustainable is it? However, um, when you actually uh, get rid of uh, solvents, it's always much more sustainable than using solvents. So cryogenic cleaning is uh, this diagram, basically. It is a projection of carbon dioxide. In this case, it's solid, but it can be used as a spray. And I will explain exactly what it is all about. There is a published paper which actually explains the cleaning process and what uh, devices are available uh, for industrial treatment. But this can also be applied to heritage treatment, provided there's a preliminary study. So basically, the process consists of three um, actions. First, we've got the thermal part, which is uh, fundamental, and then the cryogenic cleaning, which consists of two types. Uh, on the one hand, we've got the solid projectile that you have seen, which is pellets with an initial temperature of minus 78 degrees. Uh, this is the initial temperature, but then it will vary through time. And studies uh, point towards minus 12 degrees on the surface. This is also altered by environmental conditions and uh, the shooting distance. Then we've got snow blasting, but in this case, carbon dioxide is liquid and it is projected as a spray. This spray has higher temperatures and on the surface, we have detected eight degrees of projection temperature, which is uh, not as bad as minus 12. So this thermal effect uh, makes an impact on the material, making it less elastic, shrinking it, and uh, debilitating 
the, 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 the binding of the strata. In this first process, um, this would be like 60-30, or rather 60-40 whereas the other one would be kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a pressure at which the material is projected, but this depends on the device, on the mouth of the device, a projectile, the distance and the angle. The bigger the angle, the less effective it will be. And then we've got the projectile sublimation, because it's not just about the residue. When you use solvents, you've got different elements. But in this case, we've got the projectile, and that's it. Therefore, the sublimation is fostering uh, the release. However, nobody has been able to actually measure the sublimation component in the cleaning process. But they uh, dare say that the pressure of a gas after the change of state actually fosters the release of the stratum. So returning to this uh, scheme, so as I understand cryogenic um, cleaning, we've got a first impact with cracking and with um, weakening of the binding between the strata and then a detachment which derives from the change from solid to gas and then that carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. Using cryogenics in the industry is uh, widespread. It is used for huge infrastructures in order to clean every type of uh, facility and material. And in the case of the heritage, we've got different uh, deposits that have been uh, researched and published on scientific journals and uh, they basically describe satisfactory uh, cleaning of different types of debris, deposits, etc. on stone facades and sculptures, but they also refer to wood, paper, fabric, etc where uh, uh, zero resins are eliminated, as well as ashes and dust coming from fires. And finally, we also managed to uh, eliminate the tensoactive elements, which are difficult to control. Here are some examples from helmets. In this case, we, we can see a, a military helmet, and we wanted to clean it so as to uh, clean some deposits of a coat that was applied during the restoration process and which could not be eliminated because of the morphology of the mesh. So the cleaning was satisfactory, although uh, people were in such a hurry to finish the job that in the end it was submerged in a solvent. However, the cleaning process until that point was effective. This is another sculpture which is metallic by Henry Moore and they wanted to get rid of a protective coat that had been applied during a previous restoration process. So they use cryogenic cleaning with the purpose of um, keeping the original patina of the artist without damaging the protective coat which had been originally applied by the author. And finally, this is a case study talking about the tensoactive migrations, which I find very interesting. So this is a, a work by Robert Morris. It was a cleaning process made at the Smithsonian, and they have well published many papers about this intervention. So basically, they um, couldn't make sure that it was a tensoactive migration because you basically require some very complex analytical techniques so as to make sure what type of tensoactive component has migrated. However, they managed to uh, eliminate those components and restore it to its original integrity because you can see that it's a monochromatic piece. In our wish list, uh, 
for using cryogenic cleaning techniques. We would need a type of binding that is very weak so that carbon dioxide can actually achieve the detachment. Uh, the pellet <coughs> cleaning is more mechanical, but the spray one is also contains a solvent because carbon dioxide is somewhat similar to hydrocarbides. So, it, I mean, there are, there are physical binds, but you could also play with the uh, solvent property of carbon dioxide. On the, other, on the other hand, the pressure of the jet is also important when you apply this technique to fabrics or flexible materials so as no, not to cause uh, breaks because of the jet impact. The, um, Vitral transition temperature is important. We need to make sure of the safety thresholds in order to, to conserve the, the material intact, as well as the roughness of the material, which is going to help us make a more secure type of cleaning and to better control the shooting angle as well as different variables involved. With regard to using it and applying it, it's uh, it's better to do this part, this type of cleaning in a dry atmosphere, although this could be hard to achieve. Therefore, people are making different proposals, such as making a constant airflow or combining it with the projection of nitrogen in order to be able to eliminate the whole humidity condensation. Moreover, uh, you need to uh, actually hoover all of the um, debris, and you must also keep personal protective equipment in order to make the operators secure. So uh, now that we understand the starting point, this is a timeline for you to observe so that uh, I can tell you about the deep freezing part. Uh, cryogenics began in 2020, but in 2019, there was a research group from the Polytechnic University that got a patent, is a CAU, and they got a patent uh, for for preserving food, actually, and elements such as moon rocks, uh, COVID vaccines. Actually, it became prominent during the pandemic in 2020. So we we contacted them in 2021, and they were interested in being part of a joint project that I'm going to discuss briefly. And uh, you can read the Istobal chair and I will explain their involvement. This is the kind of container that they use. It is fully scalable. Right now it's a, it's a machine chamber, but the patent didn't originally look like that. It's um, using the uh, inverse Brighton cycle, so you do not have to use freezing uh, agents. So that enhances the sustainability of the device, but at the same time, it requires power so as to keep the temperature at minus 200 degrees. So this container is currently being used for a lyophilization of food. And uh, the proposal was basically uh, making uh, cold air jets and to, to, to use them as projectiles. So what's the difference between uh, cryogenic and deep freezing cleaning? There is no carbon dioxide, you're just uh, shooting uh, air. So actually, we are dealing with environmental air, and the cryogenic temperatures we aim to achieve is minus 200 degrees centigrade uh, with the pressure used for cryogenic cleaning. So if you bear in mind the efficiency rates of cryogenic cleaning, carbon dioxide can be more or less anecdotic. So 
we need to understand what is the best way to proceed so as to get rid of carbon dioxide emissions. In the project, we've got the Conservation Department, the Restoration Institute, and the Research Microcluster, and the Motores Thermicos Institute, who are the patent owners. Let me also say that uh, this is a project where I am currently working with a with a cleaning part, but we also have researchers dedicated to bio degradation, and we are um, trying to to apply the cryogenic cleaning for getting rid of microorganisms and insect killing in furniture. So this is our proposal. And we are trying to see whether it holds or it doesn't. So it's basically the same process. We <coughs> eliminate sublimation and we cause the same thermal effect with a shock, which is going to be, um, I mean, the material will be detached by the mechanical effect of air pressure. And this is a technological innovation project. And the aim of the research team is to foster responsible innovation. So we have implemented in the project the design thinking methodology, which is a participatory approach, allowing people to collaborate in the, in the technological process, including the final users with the purpose of understanding the needs of the sector, in the case of heritage, so as to be able to define uh, an affordable and eco-friendly solution, so as to actually design the prototype, which is not uh, completed, we're still working on it, and then to assess the outcomes. The outcomes, when the outcomes are not satisfactory for the community, we go back to uh, scratch and we begin all over again. Uh, during this design thinking process, we began to disseminate the project looking for funding, because obviously without funding you just cannot make it. So the Isabel Chair, which is part of, of the Polytechnic University, belongs to a car cleaning company, and they were interested in the project. I think it's the first time that actually uh, an industrial partner is interested in a heritage project. So they gave us some room and they listened to our proposal because they had a need to. So that's how we began with the design thinking process. The Istopal chair has a following need. They have to uh, clean the graffiti from trains. So they don't want to have to recoat the wagons after the cleaning. So the Istobal chair can use our knowledge in order to preserve the uh, underlying strata. So this is also interesting for them. So we, uh, we signed a technological innovation contract with the Istobal and uh, the first objectives in the first part of the research was assessing the resistance of the materials at low temperatures and aerosols, adapting the deep freezing equipment that I showed you before to the lab tests, and then analyzing the feasibility of the project, that is, whether our hypothesis could be materialized. This is the experimental table that we came up with. So uh, in the project, we have a collaborator who specializes in street art. So she uh, helped us to define which type of uh, sprays are used by graffiti painters who paint usually on the wagons and on the metro, etc. So uh, she helped us to define which which uh, sprays are the ones that uh, street artists are using. So we we had this uh, test using different, mixing different materials and solvents and using colors such as silver, which seems to be the hardest one to clean. <laughs> 
the cycle conditions were altered because these were the first tests carried out with the machine. So in the first test, we reached minus 65 degrees as a starting temperature. Then it goes through the manifold and uh, crashes onto the surface. And you can see that it's only half a centimeter, but there is a loss of 25 degrees. So by uh, replacing the component of the device, thanks to the funding that we got, we managed to reach minus 90 degrees and then minus 80 degrees of surface temperature. Uh, so the first uh, challenge that we had to tackle was that pressure was very low. Uh, I would like to explain that uh, this is like a fridge. I mean in order to explain it. So a fridge has a very low pressure. So we're basically asking the fridge to become a carter machine, and that is quite hard. So uh, thanks to the tests, we could actually uh, understand the changes that had to be introduced for the later stages of the cycle that we have already signed with Istobal. So these were the results. We could uh, eliminate bituminous uh, base coats, which have like the weakest binds. And the report has been published after the testing period. You can read it on Senodo. And the cycle conditions uh, were not the optimal ones. Nevertheless, they managed to uh, get the coat to detach completely from the surface, uh, especially with regard to the bituminous component. We also did uh, colorimetric tests to see if we were altering the rest of the sprays. Actually, we didn't with regard to the color most of the sprays were not altered, although the red, which seemed to be the most sensitive, did change a bit. Um, uh, in the adhesion tests, there was a change in the adhesion of the strata, particularly for those with a solvent base. And these are the the mesh cuts that we did before treatment and after treatment. You can see some some um, elements which are lost, and these are alterations in the binding between the strata, which uh, point towards the possibility of detachment with a higher pressure. This picture, you can see once again the bituminous areas, because I'd like to highlight this perimeter cut which uh, shows that one part of the material has broken and actually that cold is actually altering the polymeric structure of each of the sprays. Here on the right we managed to get it detached but there are alterations in the other colors. These are the colorimetric tests that we ran so it's interesting for us to know whether the support is stable or not. We also got a red surface in order to, to check out the contrast more clearly. There was a very slight alteration. So after the cleaning, the support remains stable and it is kept perfectly well. I should not finish without mentioning the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, of course, our project is linked to them. We have decided that uh, they could be summarized on these five SDGs, although we believe that um, we could also focus on some other ones. And I don't want to, to, to talk very much about SDGs because it's not my thing. But, well, that's it. We all know that they are necessary, but I would just like to talk about the impact of the project. 
It is a, a three-legged project. It is like everything that we have been explaining here. There is a scientific technical side, which is fundamental and must be taken into account because we are actually trying to understand how what is the best way to clean, to disinfect, and to kill insects without using toxic, uh, noxious uh, agents. And we want to know whether deep freezing and, um, and cold can help us get rid of solvents. There is also an economic interest, which um, has come from the industrial partner, <laughs> something that is somewhat surprising. And although it is targeted uh, to be used in the railway uh, industry, I think it can also be applied to the heritage sector. There's also plenty of industrial heritage, by the way, with similar issues with graffiti and so on and so forth. So it is also interesting for the heritage sector. And finally, I would also like to highlight the fact that it's an innovation and technology transfer project uh, integrated by a multidisciplinary team and led by women specialized in <coughs> cultural heritage. Thank you. Before beginning the discussion panel, I'd like to thank Aina for her presentation. I actually didn't know anything about cryogenic cleaning, but it seems very interesting as an alternative method. So let's, uh, well, we, we have to wrap up the conference with the Q&A. We can talk until quarter to two. So if you have any doubts or if there are any pressing questions you would like to ask, make the most of it. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the four speakers. And I have a question for Hector. When it comes to the Civil War treasure, I would like to ask, to what extent did, uh, did the sample work out? And how could it be extended to other collections with hundreds or thousands of pieces? It's true, I have not actually uh, explained it very well. Well, the, the difficulty of working with the material is, uh, well, the, the iron coins that I was talking about, uh, which were minted during the war. So that was a very problematic material, iron. It, it's a nightmare for any specialist. There are so many of them, thousands of them, and they were wet. They were put into bags to control corrosion. Well, but actually, uh, our solution was to to actually uh, give it some. I mean, continue with the observation in order to make sure that corrosion was no longer active. You know, iron always has that problem of corrosion. I mean, in the end, iron will will become um, iron dust, right? So it was interesting for us also to use an industrial um, standard for quality control. And we established a risk um, percentage and based on that uh, well we I mean according to the risk that you establish they you knew that you had to take 80 or 100 or 200 so you need to uh, make a commitment between the time it takes to analyze 80 coins in this case we scanned the 80 coins and well it took us a few hours like eight 
sorry, four hours. So, well, you know, it's um, it's rather burdensome. So you have to uh, scan each of those pieces and then uh, put them in, back in the box, etc. So it's like a compromise that you have to reach. But we set a threshold according to which when the image uh, became darker in more than 3%, which is something that you can analyze with software and that can uh, count the number of pixels in the image, then you know that corrosion is increasing. So after three years going through that control, we realize that corrosion I mean, the increase in the number of pixels was around 1%. You need to understand that this methodology is not perfect because maybe in the next sampling, you actually realize that the reduction in the black pixels does not mean that there is less corrosion, but there is always like a small uh, error margin in any measure that you take. So. Uh, based on these good results for your conservation plan, you can decide to do the following. You can diminish the sampling size. Uh, it's also true that because the coins were uh, distributed in batches according to their conservation status, first we would look at the batch which had the worst condition. So once you realize that the batches in, with the worst conditions have a degradation of less than 1% after, after three years, maybe you can decide to, that it's not necessary to look at any other batch or that maybe you will do it periodically every three or five years. So you can basically um, base your decisions on the conservation status. On the, on the actual conservation status. So you can make, basically optimize resources thanks to that. Did I manage to answer? I have a question for Patricia. In those cases where for whatever reasons uh, uh, a piece of stone was taken to a museum for restoration and maybe that piece of stone has been in the museum for 10 years because no studies have been made in order to return that stone to, to, to the street. For instance, in La Rioja, we want to return that stone to the original house or to, to the original street. So many experts say that at this point in time, returning that stone to the street would not make sense. So it would be better to leave it inside the museum to display it in the exhibition. But uh, having listened to your paper, uh, I would like to know what you would do in that case. We, this is a granite uh, virgin that used to be in the street and now she has been cleaned and restored in the workshop and we are figuring out what to do with the Virgin. Uh, shall we leave it in the museum where it will be well kept or would it be a better idea to return it to the original location in, in downtown in Laurel Street? What do you think? Well, first of all, thank you very much for asking uh, my opinion. Uh, well, you can guess what I would do. I would, I would get her back to the original location. Uh, yesterday, um, people were talking about the, the capacity of museums. I think Rodriguez talked about that and uh, basically they said that this, this, there are collections and collections and museums are finite. 
spaces. There's not enough warehouses where you can store all that. And I think that museums are interesting places that should be kept and preserved. I'm not against museums, but I think that um, public art, like you said, the fact of making it visible, accessible to people, the fact that you don't have to go to the museum to see it is good. And then we need to strike a balance between both. Of course, everything will be best kept in a museum, but it's as if you say, I will not go out because maybe a piece of roof will, will fall on my head, killing me instantly. But th this would not make sense. So when um, a decision is made to place a statue in a particular place, it is not a random decision. So people were carefully thinking about what was the best place for that sculpture. So I would certainly return it to the street. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm sure that once you, you exit, you're going to have a lot of questions going around your head. So why don't you make the most of it? Um, Hector, you have been talking about very interesting things. So the glyphosate, is it still allowed? I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was a resolution well, glyphosate is uh, carcinogenic, possibly. And the European Commission decided like a month ago, there was a moratorium and the moratorium is was renewed until 2027. I'm not sure about the date, at least until 2027. But of course, you're not forced to use glyphosate and, well, for heritage conservation, maybe, I mean, when it comes to um, drafting uh, a tender for cleaning uh, a property, I usually restrict the substances that I don't want applied, like glyphosate. Uh, so, for, uh, because of technical criteria, for instance, glyphosate is uh, banned. But well, it it has uh, to do more with sustainability. And in the world of sustainability, we we use the precautionary approach, which means that if you can do something which is less uh, damaging. You have to try and do it with the least risk possible. Because we know uh, that many elements, uh, you know, appear that would revolutionize the fields and then they would cause a lot of trouble. So you need to, to be cautious. Yeah, in your case, um, you 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 can have a, a say in that because you are actually uh, writing the conditions for the tender. Mm. But it's quite shocking because it's I mean glyphosate is a is a tricky substance, and I don't want to talk about the lobbies and so on and so forth. But I'm. Um, you know, I'm surprised to see uh, the, the nitrogen, because nitrogen is the air we breathe, like you said. And the fact that it was classified as uh, uh, toxic, I mean, th there is no nitrogen lobby. Yes, yeah, so, uh, the issue with nitrogen is, I mean, when the anoxia system was uh, implemented, as a given point in time, uh, a company um, probably took part in the in the in the 
configuration of the process. And maybe, you know, do you, you carry out a trial and with, with, with good will, but then there is a, an industrial application and sometimes a company has read your paper and they can get a patent for that substance based <coughs> on your scientific paper. And suddenly, uh, something that you were doing uh, is limited by law. That is a case of the anoxia. It's a it's a it's a paradox because we have been using with. Um, I mean, we have been um, promoting the anoxia project, and suddenly there was a change in the regulations, and and we cannot we can no longer use it. Well, at school, uh, we began using it for a few years ago, and Ines Valentin would always answer, and uh, we used argon. And, you know, with argon bottles. So, uh, my experience with nitrogen generators was rather bad. I don't know if it had to do with maintenance, but it was quite hard. To, to get the right levels. Well, because of the type of uh, uh, generation elements, which are basically membranes that separate oxygen from nitrogen, so they, there is an input of air, and then the membrane separates oxygen from nitrogen. So the membranes are full of oxygen, and suddenly they release the, the gas, and maybe it says that uh, the oximeter reads maybe 85% and it gets close to 99% and maybe uh, the, the, the the generator takes three hours to achieve the right purity. We work with plastic bags. So you want to put the gas into the plastic bag. So when you open a nitrogen bottle at 99.99999% uh, from the moment you, you 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 plug the manifold to the bottle, you've got pure nitrogen, and of course the generator needs maintenance. It has a life cycle, and they have problems. But basically, this is an option that you can use, and which is available, and. This, it doesn't mean you cannot use nitrogen bottles, but a company um, has decided to get a patent for for that. It was called Nitrogen X, and they will not sell the bottle to you. It would be interesting to just buy the, the, the nitrogen bottles off the company because that would be interesting, but we have to carry out the process and we thought, why not buy the nitrogen bottles directly? But the company said, no, I will sell you the bottle, but I have, I will make the process. I will open and close the nitrogen bag, etc. So in our institution, we do everything. Uh, I mean, we, we do anoxia, and the room is full of tiny objects, uh, such as books, codexes, statues, pedestals. I mean, we, we cannot allow the operators to, you know, to walk around. And so their solution is, is not good, but thankfully we had a nitrogen generator in the museum, a small one. And, uh, well, I suppose um, the alternative to bottles is having a generator. And I do hope that in the future we, we can also do that with, with nitrogen bottles. Okay, it's interesting uh, the role of uh, companies as allies in the case of Ida, for example, or in the case of Patricia. And also, uh, a number of different interests uh, uh, and just 
for research, but also corporate corporate interest, which would be some sort of a parallel topic, but uh, in any case, it is interesting and it is very necessary to cooperate with them in any case. Uh, we seem to have a question over there. Hello, I would like to ask a question to Hector. I've seen that you have replaced biocides with the ethanol at 70% uh, ethanol. So, how do you do that exactly? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, well, the most efficient uh, method is to uh, do the cleaning, uh, spraying, and well, cleaning and spraying. And the examples that I have given, well, we have done it with laser. Sometimes uh, we have done it mechanically, but uh, spraying, uh, cleaning, basically. Is that manual? Yes, manual. Okay, thank you. The clean, well, we use a brush, yes, and then spraying. Uh, when I have used that method, uh, whenever I've used it, we've always used a toothbrush, toothbrushes. So we buy toothbrushes uh, for the application of the ethanol. So either we spray or with the or we put the toothbrush in the ethanol and then we apply it to the surface. How do you do that? Well, we separate, I mean, uh, uh, mechanical removal from the other part of the process. So you clean it, you dry clean it first. Yes. And then how do you apply ethanol? Okay, we spray it and that's it. And then we clean it again with a brush, uh, with a brush again. Yes. Uh, the second time, once the ethanol is dry or is evaporated. Okay, I don't do it like that. Well, this is also interesting, just comparing different uh, uh, methodologies. So, the, the tiles that are used in building that are similar to stone, so how do you clean that. I mean, that type of tiles that are used to coat buildings that are similar to stone, that imitate a stone. I mean, do you treat it just like you treat gran granite? What is the material exactly? Well, it's uh, artificial stone, artificial granite. I mean, these materials that are supposed to uh, look like uh, granite or stone. Well, uh, now uh, there are a lot of transventilated facades, uh, bricks on the building, and then there is some sort of tiles that are anchored, that are thin, two centimeters, 1.5 centimeters, and it's granitic uh, rock, and it's called transventilated facades, and they're sort of uh, separated from the actual building. Um, and what we do is to apply a treatment to stop biological colonization and to change bioreceptiveness. And, and instead of uh, applying it on the outside uh, side, we uh, put it on a different side. So to change its uh, properties in terms of uh, water absorbing. So if the rock absorbs uh, water and then it loses it with the same uh, uh, facility, well, then that property is something relevant that we take into consideration. So when you have high humidity conditions, yeah, it gets dark, so how do you treat that? Okay. You have biocides, which is a big field, and then benzalconium chloride, all of that is similar. I mean, you can have different solutions, but all of them are similar. 
alcohol is something that uh, it's also used. So any alcohol that we might buy at a pharmacy has uh, benzalkonium chloride. Hydrogen peroxide can be also useful and it might be less toxic than other uh, compounds, the biotin in particular. So there is no uh, silver bullet. I am uh, in favor of not adding anything to that material. Uh, one of the studies that I did uh, uh, with Heather Weiss was about a rethinking of the bioreceptiveness uh, term. And according to Vilite, it has three different levels, healthy material, altered material, and um, materials that have experienced the action of men. So I divide it into two categories, no residue cleaning material, and also the category that corresponds to the cases where there is a residue that is being left. So in my opinion, everything that is not water is going to leave some residue. 70% ethanol has been absorbed by stone and the extent to which it evaporates, well, that idea that all of it evaporates when you apply it on stone, well, then you have to take into consideration also the porosity. A healthy rock, not the type of stone that you have on the cathedral or the St. Martin Pinario uh, monastery, it has a porosity that is lower than 1%, but a Portland cement has a 30% uh, porosity. So these are very porous rocks and when you use spraying with ethanol, uh, well, there is residue, uh, the same for biotins. So you can have your own methods. To my mind, the best biocides are those which have a low concentration of copper. Daniela Pina has conducted studies and has compiled compiled studies on long-term cleaning. So after 20 years, 30 years, she has concluded, she has found that the best solution is copper at a low percentage, even in environmentally bioreceptive areas such as jungles or areas with a rich uh, biological colonization. Otherwise, I am in favor of not adding anything. This is why I do this lighting thing, because you're not adding any external component to the material or solutions such as Cabreras, which is a great solution, to put that uh, brass, brass or bronze layer that gets integrated into the monument perfectly. and. You know, Santiago is a city where it rains all the time. So we don't need to see that as something which is negative because we, I mean, this is the city that we have. So what we need to do is to try and find allies in the conditions that can be found in this city. So regarding the question that our colleague has asked, I think that we take, we need to take this out to the street and find a system that will enable us to make it as good as possible. What about an hydro repellent, a water repellent uh, layer? Well, water repellents. Uh, many people think that that uh, type of treatment with water repellent is the way to do things, the way it used to be done in the 1990s. So things have changed a lot in, in terms of uh, hydro repellents or water repellents, 
but this is still a plastic material that you are introducing in a natural matrix. So uh, whether this is going to work or not, well, uh, it's never uh, something uh, that uh, we can be sure about. Uh, um, Benny used to say that uh, water repellent with some sort of a tapestry that is going to envelop the, por the pores. So, I don't know, thinking this uh, for a uh, porous system such as uh, granite, which is much more complex. Well, I don't know, expecting this to turn into some sort of a tapestry that's actually in a carpet that envelops it. Well, uh, for example, Sobrado dos Monches, the monastery, was cleaned five years ago and nothing was applied. Uh, I mean, uh, the Green Deal, um, sustainable framework, and now the situation of the monastery is just the same. So you have to find some solution, and that's just about cleaning. And also, Another method that Cabrera has suggested, I mean, it is very good to think that, well, something has been placed there in 1993 and then you don't need any further treatments. I mean, a treatment is going to last for some years, so what you need to do is to apply something that is going to be there acting as a barrier and that is going to work for a time. So what about lighting, lighting treatment? Well, I like lighting because it offers good results. It brings good results. We have had four years of sampling and conclusions. So cleaning goes from five to 20 years. So I think that we have improved this. But whenever I have uh, dealt with data, and presented data to the companies I have cooperated with and the institutions I have worked with, well, they thought that this was a, the perfect solution, lighten, and that's it. So I always told them that, uh, 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 well, maybe this, I mean, there is no perfect solution. I prefer to choose, you see, solutions that bring improvements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the problem is going to be eradicated. So I started using uh, lighting because I thought that there was a change of paradigm in terms of monument preservation. 30 years ago, uh, monuments were not lit during the night and no color lights. Uh, LED lights, which, I mean, they were a turning point in the market. We all have, we all have LED lights nowadays at home. So then, color lights started to be used in a random way. So that uh, system with no patterns generates some stress uh, for organisms. So I have uh, shown that this stress leads to a massive proliferation of these organisms because you're changing the growth patterns. So since we're going to be lighting monuments, let's uh, uh, look at uh, uh, these organisms as an ally and let's take that into consideration. I'm sorry, but if no microphone is used, no translation can be provided. Uh, you mean the Obradoides Square? Would I work more with the Praterioses Square? And they say that uh, there is uh, uh, Santoria Peritrina again, again. It wasn't eliminated from 1992 1998. So, and I showed the intervention patterns after the comprehensive study, and during that time it was not eliminated. And then later, uh, over the years, for, uh, well, governmental reasons, the Galician government. I don't know if there's anybody in the room here who knows this. I just don't know it. Uh, the Galician government pressurized uh, quite a lot on this. Uh, and often, colonization is combined with uh, neglect. And often, well, the other day I went to a shop 
And a woman said, okay, that's good that they have removed this uh, trees that we used to have on the street. We even had uh, birds, uh, disgusting. So people tend to associate um, colonization with uh, neglect. So this is why I say that we need to re-educate uh, people. And I am going to shut my mouth now. The function of brass in the fountain. Could you explain that? I didn't understand well what you said about the function of brass uh, and the fountain. Well, um, brass has copper, and uh, copper is a natural biocide, so it uh, generates a biocidal effect, and organisms don't grow there. Uh, but the star is bronze, which is an alloy of uh, um, copper and tin. So the star gets washed with the uh, rainfall, and that water from the rain goes down the statue. And uh, this is why there is no uh, biological colonization. The copper gets dissolved, and it kills organisms. So it generates this biocide effect. Hello, congratulations for your very interesting presentations. Um, I would like to tell you about the case that we have in the Menorca Museum. We have a cloister, it's a historical building. It's uh, made out of some uh, limestone. So one on the sides, since it is not exposed to sunlight, there is biological colonization and a lot of humidity, absorption, and on one of its uh, parts, well, there is a warehouse where we store the um, sensitive material, paint, uh, etc. So we consider the possibility of cleaning the facade to remove that uh, colonization and to use some water repellent. But after what you have said, maybe this is not the best solution. I don't know if you can just give us some advice on this or uh, some ideas. Metallic plates, maybe this would uh, uh, get uh, oxidated, this would uh, get rusty. Okay, that's the trick. You know, uh, copper, but in a very small amount. Uh, you can give me your email if you want it. I can send you the uh, studies by Daniela that uh, detail the uh, or that, or that give you the amount of copper that you need to use because you need the appropriate amount to get what you want and to stop uh, adverse effects in terms of coloring. And there's another important, <laughs> important thing in this regard. In the summer, I went to the La Lanzada Chapel in Galicia, and there are some uh, uh, problems uh, due to marine aerosols. Uh, so another thing that we don't really pay attention to is the way that the wind actually has an impact on monuments because it moves particles and projects them against the monuments. So in the case of the Prateria Square Fountain, <laughs> there is no wind impact, but there are some uh, impacts of wind in other parts of Santiago. But in the case of this uh, Alamzada Chapel, I went there because uh, uh, a professional who is 
uh, while uh, writing her PhD dissertation uh, under my direction, well, asked me about this. And my opinion was that maybe if you just um, um, install a piece of granite there, you need to find solutions, but at the same time, you need to uh, take into consideration aesthetics. When I started working with Chroma Lux, I had some ideas in terms of colors. Um, but, well, the authorities are going to refuse to accept some uh, solutions such as uh, green lighting throughout the whole night. So I had to find the solution that would keep uh, uh, the aesthetical part. So maybe if you introduce a piece of granite there, you're going to be uh, stopping the wind coming from the sea. To stop this well wind uh, from being that aggressive, and you uh, stop this aerosols uh, uh, from hitting the stones that aggressively. So these solutions might be solutions that are technical solutions. Uh, Hector said earlier today that um, there was some better ventilation and that meant that the situation totally changed. So it is about, depending on the situation, looking at the circumstances uh, and applying uh, these potential solutions on the specific case. Well, in my case, what I do is to try and find, first of all, uh, to see what is the impact that what is happening outside is having inside, and then look at the potential solutions, maybe uh, moving things around, pieces in the room or increasing ventilation, or maybe installing a panel in the middle. So you might do that, but this is uh, uh, having an impact on humidity. So. I'm saying this because, I mean, in terms of sustainability, passive steps such as that, uh, uh, well, piece of granite to stop the aggressiveness of these particles that uh, come with the wind, uh, these are normally uh, lasting solutions and good solutions. So they can have a number of advantages. And you can see that over time. This thing I've told you about the chapel, well, there was a wall that protected it, protected it and that it's not there anymore. And the same thing happens with the Lugo Roman wall. The other day I was interviewed in the uh, radio on the radio and they asked me about the Verin Hotel, about the Lugo Roman Wall. So what is my opinion about the Roman Wall? Well I think that it was painted in white for a long time. It had uh, uh, well mortar uh, and a there was, well, junctures between the different uh, rocks. And if you take away the plant that is growing there, well, you have an impact on the juncture. And that uh, plant grows again, and it's growing on the juncture, which is uh, naked. So what I suggest is to uh, apply junctures. So. Uh, the Faculty of Biology of Santiago conducted a project for Tenerife. So the mindset was 1970. In the 1900s, people thought about things. Uh, if the Lugo wall had uh, mortar or plaster, there was a reason behind that. So if we have 
old pictures, well, I like to look at them just to get ideas from that. Yes, it was painted in white with lime. There you go. Thank you. No problem. Okay, thank you very much to all of you for your um, presentations, for your ideas, for your comments. I would like to uh, talk about what Pratithia has said about uh, mixing biodiversity and cultural heritage. I think that this is of fundamental importance. We cannot try to save the planet if uh, plants are uh, being annoying for us, uh, birds are being annoying for us. Fernando said yesterday that you had uh, shown that sustainability was not about more work, it was about more attention, paying more attention. And I think that your projects are uh, following this uh, direction. It's about observing. If we see that a biological colonization is uh, um, water repellent, well, then we have a solution. So I am in favor of well, what you have suggested, Patricia, because I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, lichens have a role to play. You don't need to clean everything. It's not about the statics, about the way it looks. And then also, uh, well, museums cannot uh, just uh, store everything. It doesn't make sense that uh, we just keep things in a warehouse just to preserve these assets and we don't have the society access to these uh, assets. And on top of that, we need to have a biological natural process uh, for this uh, well property to be uh, colonized as long as this is not deteriorating it, of course. But uh, well, we have seen that uh, a lot of these uh, plants do not uh, harm the assets, but they protect it even. So biodiversity, again, is everything, really. So I agree. Hello, I would like to ask you the following questions. If the walls that we have in the Galician countryside uh, that are ancient walls dating back uh, uh, centuries ago, two centuries ago, I mean, to these walls, I mean, is it compulsory for the owners to actually preserve them? And also, uh, I mean, what could we use for the walls? I mean, cement or other types of um, materials uh, as masonry for these walls. Well, I have uh, done a study with the Oxford University on walls and on um, corals for uh, livestock and there is a concept that is called biological cultural heritage that is strongly linked to this and what I did was to compare uh, 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 farmyards in Cornwall and in Lausanne and Frechan near Santiago de Compostela and <laughs> look at the similarities. This has been published in Land and it's uh, an interesting uh, study because it's about uh, recovering the historical memory at that level. So I know that this type of farmyards that were used to keep the livestock, uh, this is uh, considered a part of the heritage. And about, uh, uh, well, that masonry uh, question you asked, well, we don't use cement and maybe lime mortar. Uh, Marta knows more about uh, mortar. Um, again, we would never use cement in old walls, so we use lime mortars, exactly. 
So why not? Cement, why not? Because it has a much greater resistance than that uh, ancient wall and its composition. There are salts that are going to uh, bring more salts and are going to be incorporated to that uh, old masonry. Also, let me say that uh, the need to preserve a number of walls and elements has a heritage component, a legal component. For example, well, the example of the mountain range of the north of Madrid, over there, people are, uh, have to uh, maintain the walls and use a specific type of materials for that, and they are uh, they have to well, preserve them because it's in the legislation. So in this case, you do have to preserve the wall in a specific form with the specific materials. So it is established by law and you have to be aware that you have to respect the law for that. So this is the first thing you need to take into consideration before you even think about um, uh, doing something with a wall. And you have to take into consideration also the compatibility of the materials. There seems to be another question. We need to stop here. Well, it's just a comment, really. We need to look at the type of wall. The tri juncture is uh, uh, a relevant thing. Uh, we know that there is no uh, solution for everything, there is no silver bullet that is. Uh, silver bullet that is applicable to all cases, so we need to uh, just uh, take that into consideration. Okay, we're going to close the debate here, and we move on to the closing ceremony. Thank you very much to all the attendees. Well, uh, the organizers have uh, told me that I should make like a scientific summary of everything that was said during the conference, but just they told me I should do it. But it's very hard to make a 10 minute summary of the whole uh, papers. But first of all, I'd like to thank the attendees. And I would also like to thank the museum coordinators for organizing this conference to everybody, Agar, Moises from the technical side, but also the scientific commi committee, which I have already mentioned at the start, Oscar Sonia Naranta, on behalf of the museum, Andrea, Susana, Anton, Pablo, Carme, e Christi and Christina, who were not here today, uh, all of the teaching staff and all of the staff from the BCM. To me, this is the 12th conference. I think it's one of the best that I have attended. I mean it, really. Um, it's probably the most important <coughs> and the best. Um, before actually making a summary, uh, let me just say that we should prepare the 12 plus one for next year and maybe we should also uh, analyze the pending subjects which is multiplying the impact. There are not so many conferences on restoration and conservation. So when I talk about multiplying the impact, we should have uh, online access. Actually, I have just been told that you will get YouTube access. And hopefully, we can also have access to some of the previous conferences online. So maybe we should uh, publish the minutes of the conference for the future. Or we could have posters, a poster session, so that we can have like a m more um, widespread conference. So we want to do sustainable growth, you know. Because there are actually very few uh, foray talking about conservation and restoration. So basically, the decisions we make about the future and the sense of cultural heritage are the same ones that we make on natural heritage and the destiny of the planet and humankind. So we are talking some serious stuff. 
And I think the most striking part was that there is a human being that measures for uh, 40 hectares. Uh, Pando, which is a which is a, um, a, a, a forest in the in Utah in the USA. So I think that uh, the natural landscape can only be understood from the point of view of humankind because we are animals after all. So uh, as opposed to the specialization required by science, and we we should also uh, have a more holistic approach to heritage because uh, not just that also uh, the archaeology of landscape is a similar branch because there's only one single heritage which has several dimensions such as artistic economic social cultural ethnographic there are different dimensions of the same heritage uh, people can make individual decisions, such as replacing uh, silica with other elements. But they're also important, such as uh, sorting out trash, buying less plastic. So it's about uh, thinking global, acting local, and having an international outreach. So it was important to uh, also have the support of ICOM and actually these associations will be the sum of the actions of its members so you should become part of associations you should not feel alone in your endeavors we must have our voices heard at unesco at the ministries we can only do that as a group and from the points of view of the content uh, it was very interesting uh, to to have an introduction of the Green Book by the Ministry, which was introduced yesterday. Uh, today we have we had a more specific, uh, like practical approach, or a more scientific approach. We talked about anoxia, uh, gels, uh, gloves, lichen, etc. And what conclusions could be drawn? Well, there must be a combination. There must be a combination of innovation and tradition. We heard about some very interesting projects, innovative projects, but they were constantly referring to the tradition, to the recovery of the intangible heritage. On the other hand, people were talking about the practical aspects of uh, labor and the false liberalism of uh, the capital. There is an excessive bureaucracy on the one hand, but on the other hand, there is less control on the quality of the work. So this is a contradiction that we all suffer as workers, and it has an impact on personal and on labor conditions. And uh, people have exposed uh, different contradictions. We are here in person. We could perhaps have had a virtual meeting, so it, could, it would not be the same, to be honest. I mean, some things uh, should not be replaced, like uh, meeting uh, other people and speaking uh, to other people in person. It's, it's fine to, be, to decrease the number of flights, but it's still necessary to speak with other human beings. Um, it was also said that a bigger efficiency could uh, also have an impact of a bigger abuse. Also, uh, there's a, this movie by Ken Loach, Sorry, We Miss You, which is about the impact of global trade and transport in the world. And other contradictions, such as uh, the fact that we get rid of pigeons, but we introduce the swift and thus uh, cleaning uh, necessarily um, go hand in hand with decolonization. Well, that's a contradiction. In Galicia, we can see the impact of the wind farms on the natural and cultural heritage, which is uh, appalling. And we're actually fighting against the widespread wind farms. But at the same time, wind farms are clean energy. Reality is a matter of scales. Uh, we cannot replace every car with electric cars. Maybe we can replace the buses, but not every single 
individual uh, car. There have been uh, very high level scientific papers, important quotes by Calvino, by Gramsci. Uh, we thought we were going to talk about lighting and lumen counts, etc. But it was illumination rather than lighting what we were talking about. So uh, he looks like Voltaire, you know, preaching from the pulpit. But that was necessary too. And uh, it was also said that we swallow the equivalent of a credit card size in microplastics. This is actual. This, we are digesting a credit card size of microplastics a week. And people said revolution will be slow or it will not be. Okay, slow but constant. Because if the destruction is faster than conservation, then we are lost. I really enjoyed uh, the last talk, which was a pre-doc student, very interesting. She gave a talk about uh, the role of women researchers in the field of uh, restoration, and they have proven that you can make it. So women researchers are actually showing that uh, they can make it, the impact of the youth in general is fundamental, but you didn't speak about something. Can you think about it? You didn't speak about the weird combination between uh, climate activism and museum vandalism. So maybe we are a bit reluctant to talk about that, but it is an obvious topic, so we just ignore it. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that nobody came and broke any statues. Uh, 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 you didn't talk about that, right? I have 30 seconds left, but I'm going to speak a little bit more because I want to answer a question. Well, it is a personal opinion though, but um, I asked Kim, Kim, why key? What does key mean? Key culture. And it was not quite clear to her. So internationally, the key is a concept from Japan. It is well known. It comes from Japan. A key means energy in, in Japanese. I don't know if they took it from Japanese, but it could be translated as energy because you know that Japanese is uh, like multi-semic polysemic so key is also power strength energy so often it is combined with I which means love harmony the kanji of the I is like a roof and then it's like a like a box or a house with a roof so I key means the harmony of energies so when we talk about balance, uh, people spoke about the uh, balance between the aptitude of the intervention, the sociocultural benefits and the economic efficiency. So that match is something that we know in restoration, you need to stabilize the problems with the smallest intervention possible and to return things to their original state. So conservation and restoration have a lot to teach to the rest of society. So that's something that we should be able to convey as a message. I'm speaking to the students. You should convey that message about the need of restoration. And the, the battle that we are fighting will never be won because Equilibrium is never perfect. It's imperfect by definition. Thank you. I'd like to apologize on behalf of Angel Stilve, the museum's director, because she had to go to the provincial government. So she told me that I should um, close the seminar myself. So 
On behalf of the museum and on behalf of the museums, as a forest of knowledge, like Morian said yesterday, I'm really satisfied uh, with this seminar. There, there is a lot of work and effort behind it, but it was a good starting point to actually raise awareness among the audience about the topic. I think in this museum and in many others, we are going through times of change because we are like immersed in these problems with uh, building refurbishments. So we, uh, we, are, we are wondering what about sustainability in these refurbishments? What is the uh, expense? What is the uh, carbon f footprint, the social footprint, the water footprint, etc.? And people also said that we have a very big uh, lack of scientific knowledge. And we, if we do not understand or if we are not trained in science, we will mistake terminology. And that's a problem. So uh, I think these um, seminars are scientific seminars. We need training, we need to rethink, we need to uh, reflect constantly, question everything, analyze our circumstances. And I think that museums are, um, I, well, you know, we have to, to to follow uh, reuse as a as a policy for sustainability and we need to motivate our suppliers uh, our contractors about this need for sustainability uh, giving extra points for sustainability and sharing this need with the staff also motivate them and you know uh, sometimes there is room for improvement uh, we need to 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 widen the range of materials that we use and this will help us to contribute to the mitigation of the carbon footprint people were asking about what about people somebody said yesterday if we do not understand that the conservation of heritage is targeted to people uh, then uh, nothing has been understood because that's exactly the purpose of preserving heritage uh, museums are social spaces for people accessible to all and that's where we are working uh, so as to to serve society so going back to the title, sustainable museums between uh, question marks, possibly not, but we should not be pessimistic about the future. You have a long future ahead and there is no way back. And just to finish, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank all of the speakers for your amazing work for your positive response to our invitation. I would also like to thank the school for taking part and collaborating with us. I would also like to thank the scientific committee, my uh, colleagues from the department, my colleagues from the museum who have helped us, uh, Agar also uh, for her coordination, Moises, everybody, because this is a joint uh, effort. This is uh, this is the way to go forward. And then thanks to all of you, because if you were not here, there would be no point. In recent years, this uh, conference has been very successful, and we are extremely satisfied. We will try and upload on the website links to the green book, links to the lighting book and other links that the speakers believe to be useful. For participants, we also intend to upload a satisfaction survey for you to fill in uh, so that you can come up with uh, suggestions for next topics for discussion. And that's it. We'll see you again next year, and I hope 
that you will continue working in that field. Thank you very much.